G'day Legends, I hope that you're well. This video is somewhat of a remake or at least more information about the podcast I did uh, two episodes ago, which was about the CBRN threat, the chemical, biological, nuclear uh, radiation threat that exists in well the world and Ukraine. There was some um, points made and some information that got brought up in that last episode that was... Um, somewhat misleading or in some cases actually incorrect and I do actually really give a shit about that so I have two experts uh, Andrew and Shane who have come on with me they'll explain who they are uh, in the beginning of this episode and then we'll go on from there so look uh, I do really appreciate uh, the feedback and I do take that on board uh, and I apologize if there was anything that was misleading uh, put in that. It was never my intention. Uh, I bring experts on for things that obviously I don't know about and I guess there's an element of I don't know what I don't know so I couldn't say that was incorrect or not or whatever. So let's hope we fixed it and I hope uh, that you enjoy it. So it's a long one um, so maybe crack a beer. Okay thanks guys. Ah, right. Well, gentlemen, <laughs> uh, <laughs> take two. You take two. All right. Um, so, Shane, Andrew, thank you guys so much uh, for coming on and you know talking to me about maybe some things that we missed uh, in the last podcast I did on specifically CBRN uh, relating to Ukraine, but also these chemical, biological, nuclear, radioactive environments. Um, I really appreciate your guys' input, and I've had a lot of feedback on some things that may be um, maybe wrong in some sense, or maybe just uh, worded in a way that is maybe correct, but doesn't give the full picture uh, of what is actually going on and within those um, those environments. And these are very dangerous environments, and it's a very realistic threat, at least in my opinion. So I do want to get this correct, uh, and I do want to put as much solid, good information breakdown. Um, to maybe ease some people's nerve nervousness and some feelings uh, and express, I guess, your both of your expertise on this. So, look, uh, Shane, we might start with yourself. Uh, just give us a quick rundown of, uh, I guess, your background, your experience, uh, and your experience relating to uh, the CBRN threat. Yeah, uh, g'day, Willie. Uh, g'day, Andrew. G'day, everyone. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, when I rejoined the Army uh, in 2009 and got uh, posted back into Special Operations Command, um, I was actually posted into um, the Special Operations Engineer Regiment as a CBRN E threat analyst. Um, so I really spent the majority of my time working that problem set, which plugs you into uh, everything globally, especially at that stage in Afghanistan and Iraq with the IED threat. So um and as part of that you know you, you've got to do you go away and you conduct chemical uh familiarization training um biological uh, nuclear radiological you work closely with the defense science and technology group on understanding what goes into making these agents and um and then the threat actors so who's actually doing this at, at a state or a government level and then what uh threat groups are doing it so um, you know, and I guess the culmination of that was uh, as the head uh, intelligence analyst uh, for the um, chemical attacks in Syria around the, that started really around August 2013. Uh, so really delving into um, was a, a chemical attack and a, a sarin attack and what did that involve and who did it. And, uh, you know, your threat actors at that stage were, were Russia, um, Iran, and obviously the, the Syrian government uh, with al-Assad. So, uh, yeah, so I was really involved in that. Uh, and then also looking at, um, you know, the nuclear and the, and I guess Andrew will go into it, but the difference between a, a nuclear device or a nuclear attack and a um, radiological device and a, a radiological attack. Um, so yeah, understanding that threat picture. Then in 2014, when the... Uh, Russian separatists shot down um, the Malaysian airlines in Ukraine. Um, I was one of the uh, ADF analysts assigned to providing a CBRN E threat and protection picture for um, the government uh, personnel that were deploying in as part of uh, Operation um, uh, Return the Bodies that Prime Minister Abbott at the time 
sanctions. So a lot of AFP went over to Ukraine and there was an ADF element that went with them. Um, and uh, my role in that uh, Operation Horwick was as uh, the lead um, CBRNE threat analyst looking at those threats in Ukraine, which I guess is pretty topical um, for what we're going to talk about today. And and it's one thing that, um, you know, I continue to monitor just out of habit, to be honest, and I'm still uh, plugged into that community. So I still get messages and uh, and and uh, emails from people saying, what do I think about different events and stuff around uh, around the world? So that's my background in a nutshell, I guess. Yeah, awesome. And I guess we'll get more into those incidents and how you've sort of got your finger on the pulse of this and specifically also on the pulse in Ukraine with your experience there. Um, Andrew, can you give us a quick rundown on on yourself, your background, and I guess where you've been, what you've done? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having us, Willie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the, on the show. <laughs> so I'll just uh, describe my military background as it relates to the NBC or CBR aspects. So I'm from an army officer background. I, I did chemistry and physics at uni in the late 90s. In 2003, four-ish, I did the School of Military Engineering's, NB I think it was NBCD back then. Um, a, a similar course to your, your previous guest, 2005, I went and did a whole raft of courses in North America. So I did my EOD training in North America with the Americans out of Eglin. Uh, we looked at sort of chemical weapons in the sense of how are traditional rockets, mortars, artillery shells, things like that. How are they used in, in that sense? A little bit of chemical training there. Uh, and then in Canada, we did, uh, some further higher level NATO kind of CBR, NBCD, uh, staff officer courses. Uh, we did live agent training in Canada uh, for chemical threats. And we also did some radiation safety stuff, which included some live agent training as well. Came back in 2006 and worked at the EOD section, um, the bomb disposal section at School of Military Engineering for a couple of years. And then at the search section, which is uh, including the dogs, 2008. 2008, nine, I deployed with the American EOD Brigade Task Force Troy to Baghdad. Uh, and that was all the weapons intelligence teams, the EOD teams responding for the various divisions around that area. Uh, 2009, I, I came back to IRR at the time, uh, did a bit of stuff on the projects, the couple of key defense projects, uh, 2110 and 3025. Some people might've heard of, they, they relate to CBR and D uh, equipment training, stuff like that. Uh, deployed with SOTG um, in the headquarters role uh, in operations. Uh, and that was pretty much, uh, there were a couple other small capability development things, but that's pretty much the end of my um, full-time army career. Uh, since then, for the last few years, um, myself and my business partner have been running a company called Red Team Training Solutions. So we do a lot of uh, ID electronics and home ad explosives training for police, military. We build a lot of ID training aids, in print canine teams, things like that. So we do a lot of the asymmetric kind of um, use of chemicals or radiological sources in improvised weapon systems. Um, but we still sort of keep our finger in the pie when it comes to looking at state-based or, or more industrially produced um, CBRN threats, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, it's a good overrun of your experience. Something um, that I want to touch on with both of you actually is that both of you have done live agent training, you know, dealing with these chemicals or whatever they are live. Um, can you just run us over how that looks and and I guess what it's like dealing with these? Like Shane, if you want to jump in. Uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> I did uh, my first exposure um, with uh, the Defence Science and Technology Group um, and... Um, very, very quickly, you have to have faith in all the stuff that you were paying off earlier about how to um, firmly adjust and um, wear your mop for gear and um, the validity and the uh, sensitivity of the sensors you're going to use. Um, so it's one thing, and, and most soldiers have been through uh, putting their mop for gear. So that's the actual chem bio suit you would have seen in all the movies and the mask and stuff. And they're going in a room, but there's a little bit of CS gas, which, you know, if you've, if you've been exposed to it a few times, you, you, you know, you're pretty right. Um, and, you know, so you, you kind of, um, uh, you know, don't really have to be that, I'll say, serious. 
But then when you're actually going into, and then uh, later on, um, uh, we go overseas to Canada to do some more training. And um, it's, I guess it's a bit like um, when you're doing a dive course and you're, you're learning how to use your, your regulator and your BC on the surface. But then when you're underwater, you really got to, um, it, it comes serious. So um, for me, there was a few, um, you know, um, going over my doffing and donning drills and making sure that my seals were correct and purging was good. Uh, but once you do it like most environments, once you do it once and the confidence you get from it, um, but it was uh, for the role I was doing at the time, um, you know, potentially sending um, solar operators into a, a hot zone or a chemical environment, you know, uh, again, it, it's one of those humbling experiences where you've got to get your information right. So I found it um, an excellent course to have done. Um but definitely the switch between uh, play and real gets flicked on very quick. Yeah. And yourself, Andrew, was that similar to what Shane said? Uh, yeah, yes, definitely some overlaps. Um, I, I think when you're in the military, certainly um, in my, uh, well, most of my junior years up until post 30, I, I think you, you can be a bit naive as to the risks that are involved in some of the training you do because it's the military. You you make you do make a lot of assumptions that whoever's organising the training, well, they're not going to let anything happen to me. So this this will be okay. And and certainly, we run live agent training now, so we have students prepare their own explosive materials under supervision. And I, I have a completely different outlook now for putting people in front of live agents, whatever the live agent is. But suffice to say that the training we did in Canada, um, the live agent stuff was was really good. It, for confidence that your detection identification systems work. So we did some stuff in, in a, it was in a fume hood, sure, but we were in bioprotective equipment using uh, at the time, the, the current detection suite and to see the instrument respond the way it should respond when it detects the presence of that, that threat vapor, that's good. You know, you, you know, your instruments work. The field stuff um, we did in, in Canada as well. And, and it, it's scripted. And it can feel a little bit artificial, but really in terms of crawl, walk, run, when you're learning about this stuff, it, you're at a walk stage. So you've done all your crawl and preparation. It, it's not a wide area dispersal. It doesn't require huge amounts of decontamination. It's usually a small quantity. Um, again, this is 2005. So a lot may have changed since, since then, but it's a small quantity and you know what you're dealing with, you know where it is, um, but still all the same, it, it's a real threat environment so everything gets pretty serious pretty quickly um just because there there is that outlying risk and of course if you don't do your drills properly they always threaten you same with radiation safety stuff um if you come up hot on the decon line um where you're going back into that hot area to get re-decontaminated or to weather whatever you've got on you and nobody wanted to be the one left behind for hours or days waiting for that to happen yeah absolutely <laughs> Absolutely wild. I remember coming out of, cause I did one of the tours through Chernobyl and even that you have to do like a little, like a test at the end to see if you have been somewhere you haven't. And it's always a bit like, cause you know, every guy wants to go somewhere like, Oh, I want to go in that building. And it'd be <laughs> fucking embarrassing if you showed up and like, well, you haven't, you haven't followed the tour, mate. Yeah. But I, I couldn't imagine the level of decontamination that you guys must go through doing. So I remember like writing a, uh, writing an exercise for the, um, tactical assault group and a lot of the exercises you just say there's a device um in in a room or in a location and it's kind of scripted that way but this actual exercise we had a small radiological source in a room so they actually have these monitors and i won't go into those details but when it, it they're set to the, the detection when they uh they uh hit a source they start beeping mm. And a lot of uh, the the assaulters had never actually experienced those detectors going off, and they didn't realise that for this this uh, this exercise we actually had a very very small source controlled you know gosh man snow and all the instructors at at, uh, at so are experts in this and anyway so you know they are used to just you know breaching a door going in and and conducting their drills, but all of a sudden they're going in and. Beep, 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 beep. And they literally stood and it was that because going from a what used to be a um, 
uh, just a training scenario, it became real life real quick. And um, yeah, it's a different concept. It doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing. When all of a sudden that realism is put into it. Um, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a very interesting day. Is there, is there something really in there? Well, that, that's the scenario. Yeah, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. So look, this talk, okay, now that you've sort of outlined, I guess, who you guys are and your qualifications, this is going to be, I guess, a follow-on from the previous video. There were some problems brought up with the last one um, that we're looking to get, you know, to the truth of. It's not a debunking of anything. It's just more information, uh, potentially better information. Uh, but really what we want to do is put out there, like, what realistically the threat scenarios of a CBR usage in Europe most commonly or most threat at the moment, I guess, is Ukraine, is in Ukraine. Um, Shane, if you could really begin just giving, I guess, some broad terms, using your experience, and what do you really think that the threat of CBRN now in Ukraine is and what could then be used? So I'll break it down uh, into threat from C, threat from B, uh, and I'll do a broad brush and you know I'll let Andrew get into some more of the technicalities of what that threat actually looks like on the ground. Hmm. Um, if you look at early in the um, special military operation, you know, uh, February, March, April time, um, straight away there was a lot of talk, will Russia use chemical weapons in Ukraine? Um, and the um, feeling globally at that time was no. And one of the reasons for that was they just thought that he was just going to roll through Ukraine. And um, unlike when we saw the Syrians with the Russian help, use them in Syria. It was because uh, Al-Assad was backed into a corner and that portion of the population eth ethnically isn't like really his cohort. So he didn't really have that much uh, to fear, but a lot to gain by using chemical weapons against uh, some of the Syrian popula population. And so the initial uh, assessments in Ukraine was, well, He's not going to be backed into a corner. The Russians are going to roll through Ukraine, um, and you know it's not going to it's not going to be a matter of uh, months before Ukraine settles. Obviously, that hasn't happened, and we've seen uh, Putin get more and more desperate, which is when the rhetoric started of um, him conducting one of these stall attacks. Um, the first reported uh, incident or attack that the Russians. Um, uh, reported to have used some sort of chemical device was in April 11, 2022. There were reports that Russia used a drone uh, to conduct a um, an attack in the city of Mariupol. Now, that wasn't confirmed, but just that then showed, that was when the war started turning against Putin. Um, and already there was uh, reports that he was thinking or had, had done that. Um, since then, there's been a number of other reports. Uh, but now what we're seeing is he's really in that withdrawal and consolidation phase. This is really when, in my opinion uh, and my assessment, he's more likely to use um, even a chlorine attack uh, because it has two effects. One, it, it has a massive effect on the population and on the, the military force, just from the actual effect it has uh, on their bodies, but to the psychological effect. So the Russians pull out of a city and say, come and get it, but we're then going to um, attack you with, you know, sarin or even chlorine. Those troops are going to be a lot hesitant to move back into those areas. And we saw that uh, recently with the withdrawal um, and, you know, is it a trap? There was a lot of reporting, if you remember, coming out of Ukraine. Is it, are the Russians just setting the Ukrainian forces up? So um, I think, you know, uh, it's probably that we will see some form of uh, chlorine um, attacks or, or reporting of chlorine attacks. Um, at this stage, I think it's um, unlikely that the Russians will use a, a state-sponsored and over- uh, chemical attack, uh, but in saying that, I think it's there's a, a high probability that some of the separatist groups that are, are Russian uh, aligned 
in those contested areas could use um, some form of crude dispersal device, uh, you know, uh, similar to, say, a McTarber device, which we've seen uh, Al-Qaeda use through um, uh, the Pacific and into the Middle East. Um, that's more uh, likely. One thing that the Russians don't have in Ukraine that they had in Syria is freedom of uh, movement and freedom of action in the air. So in, uh, in Syria, they could quite easily use their helicopters to fly into an area and drop a barrel bomb or, or multiple barrel bombs. They don't have that luxury in uh, Ukraine. The Ukrainians are doing a pretty good job of shooting them down. Uh, that does bring the drones into play, uh, especially those the, the uh, quote-unquote um, Iranian drones. And, uh, and that report out of uh, April said that that's how they used, uh, yeah, they used a drone as a delivery system. Um, so I think, um, uh, unless you want to jump in on the chem sp space now, Andrew, or, or, or hit it after I go through the lot. It, it probably might be better, Willie, if you want, we'll just go through and hit, you know, CB, R and N as, as, as sort of their own blocks and yeah. weave, weave some background in as well as some current thread and that kind of thing yeah that'd be great because you know i think there is some at least even from me and i've done a level a small level of training in the in the army to this but to break down what you know this cb rnn actually are and and the effects so if you want to go on with that that'd be great yeah, oh, yeah for sure that's easier for the listener if we just stick yeah. to chemical yep. And, yeah yep for sure well so all the stuff that i'm going to talk to just to give a um disclaimer I'm not going to go into the intricate, intricate details of each individual one, how it was developed, all that sort of stuff. We need to talk a little bit about the subcategories of chem, of bio, et cetera, insofar as what are the pros and cons of its use as a conventional, um, in a conventional attack versus the pros and cons, you know, ease of manufacture risk, all this stuff in an unconventional style and and we have in some instances some historical references and then in other cases we have very little you know we don't have a lot of nuclear weapons deployment history to look at so if we start at chemical it's good to look at chemical in the broad categories of nerve agents so your traditional nerve agents are your sarins vx's um, g series etc there's a bit to that then there's blister agents and the one that everyone knows is mustard gas um, then you've got blood agents which are your cyanides and they really affect your blood's ability to carry uh, oxygen around the body so that's a an inhalation hazard versus some of the others uh, nerve agents are faster acting compared to blister agents there's there's subtle and important differences which we can get to uh, and then the choking agents so they're the, the least technically difficult to manufacture and employ and that's your chlorines your phosgenes and things like that um, what shane alluded to before are some other methods of producing chemicals such as knockdown gases so these are at the lower end the lower technical skill level and it's generally combining uh, two or more chemicals um, where you know what the reaction is going to be so for example there's different ways to generate chlorine gas in an improvised fashion uh, some of these are available at hardware stores. Uh, they generally take, you know, different forms. They're lower potency, they're, they're, but they're easier to get. You know, they they can be prepared by more of a novice versus, you know, VX, for example. We've never seen an insurgent group develop VX as far as I'm aware because it's not easy. Uh, the process is difficult. You need to be well-resourced. You need to be well-educated, has a lot of PPE threats, things like that. So that's sort of broadly how they, they are. Then you've got other things like incapacitating agents, choking agents like CS and all that sort of thing. They're kind of broadly grouped up as chemical weapons per se. Um, so looking at how they act, the, the method of how they're designed to work, nerve agents are can be quite uh, persistent. So VX is quite a persistent nerve agent, which means that if you fire an artillery shell with VX in it and it sprays the droplets all over the ground, that can be there for some days to weeks in some instances. It all depends on weathering, right? The, the wind direction, temperature, is it raining, all that sort of stuff. Now, VX is really designed to kill, incapacitate fairly quickly. Um, you don't have a whole lot of time once, once exposed. It's, it's quite nasty stuff. Um, 
your blister agents take a little bit long to affect you, right? So they, unlike nerve agents that affect the nervous system, as the name implies, blister agents cause blistering of the skin internally, externally. And you may be exposed to blister agents and not know it for some time, some matter of hours. Um, they they can kill, of course, but it's a different effect. M mustards and stuff like that can also be quite persistent. So both nerve and mustard can be used to kill, can also be used to deny terrain, to deny someone the freedom of movement through the terrain for fear of getting um, injured, killed, etc. So as a delaying tactic uh, can be employed, but we're not talking about radiation contamination, which may have a lasting effect for years. Generally speaking, chemical weapons are going to have a shorter duration uh, effect and you don't necessarily need to do anything with it. You can allow it to naturally weather and then, you know, use that area. In terms of conventional deployment, um, uh, Shane and I were talking about the Chemical Weapons Convention and according to the OPCW, the Office, of Prolifera the Office for the Prevention of uh, Chemical Warfare, I think that's right, yeah. OPCW, they're responsible for, um, you know, monitoring the, all the treaties and agreements that people made to destroy stockpiles of things, um, chemical things. And according to them, back in 2017, all of the declared stockpiles that Russia had were destroyed. Now, I'm not an intel guy and I don't have any specific information, but you it doesn't mean to say that Russia doesn't still have something. It doesn't mean to say they haven't developed something else. Um, so is there a conventional persistent threat? Yes, there, there certainly could be. It could be delivered by aerial spray tanks from fast jets. It could be delivered by exploding uh, airburst rocket systems, projectile systems, uh, closer range mortar systems. There's all sorts of ways you could deploy it. The risks of using chemical weapons in that conventional sense is a huge red flag. So it, it really that, that kind of deployment would be held at a very high level. Um, and, and someone is going to make the call to use that because once you've done it, it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. I don't, it depends where you're trying to achieve it. All of the recent chemical use stuff, we're not talking about the Cold War days where people were worried about spreading 4,000 liters of VX over uh, all of Eastern Europe. You know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about small specific employment of the chemical to achieve an effect. And there's a number of different effects they could have. In the unconventional sense, certainly they have tried um, to develop chemical warfare agents. I think the furthest they've got from my research was, um, you know, in places like Mosul, where they had access to smart people, uh, the chemical precursors, um, processes, protective equipment, they, they made some mustard gas and that was employed in roadside bombs, in mortars that they also made themselves, but they never got to the point of making huge stockpiles of it, delivering it, you know, over long distances by aircraft bomb, by rockets, etc. Now, ISIS has got some very smart people. And if that's as far as they got, I'd suggest that it's probably because chemical good, high quality chemical weapons are hard to make and certainly hard to make at scale, move around and employ at that scale. So unconventionally, if you're talking about rear area uh, threats to big cities that Russia now may be looking at going, hey, well, we'll never have Kiev. So maybe that's something they look at doing uh, as a, um, you know, a tactic, employing chemical weapons in areas where they're not concerned about the civilian population. So in the region they're fighting now that potentially Russia wants, there'll be reluctance to use chemical weapons that could affect people that it's trying to keep on its side, the local residents. So that that's a factor as well. Did you, do you want to jump in there, Shane? Yeah. So um, I think one of the biggest differences that we're going to, that we're seeing uh, and we'll continue to see in Ukraine compared to Syria. Now, both were Russian state backed uh you know, military or special military operations. The difference is um, the Ukrainian separatists that are Russian aligned are very, very much funded and take their orders from the Russian military. Um, so they're going to have, um, they're not going to go uh, quote unquote rogue. Whereas in Syria, you had a lot of um, factional groups that had their own uh path or their own kind of ideology and um and end state um so uh, 
Putin in both cases uh, and in most cases uses the, his rhetoric first, uh, followed up by um, some action. Um, and uh, I think he uses psychological warfare and that's one thing that we've got to really consider. When we talk about chemical uh, and biological uh, warfare, the psychological um, component is massive. Um, you know, the, one of my um, interesting things when I started really researching this subject was, you know, why didn't Hitler use uh, chemical weapons uh, a, a against the US and the, the Brits in World War II? Well, he actually suffered uh, from mustard attacks when he was in World War I and it scared him, like it really freaked him out. And and that that psychological uh, response stayed with him. And, and that's one of the reasons why he was very hesitant to use them in a, in a military sense. Uh, you know, we won't get into some other stuff, but um, so even the, the uh, and as Andrew alluded to, moving chemical uh, weapons around, even crude or especially crude ones, takes a lot of logistical uh, capability. You know, you've got to wear your mop gear. So they actually stand out to foreign intelligence agencies. So because Ukraine's such a drone war, uh, you know, the Ukrainians have got excellent eyes in the skies, they would be able to detect changes in um, PPE posture of either Russian troops or uh, those Ukrainian forces being backed by Russia. Yeah, right. Uh, you, you said in that that you know the the Russian militia or well, these groups are you know may not potentially go rogue, but isn't that exactly what we saw when they shot down the Malaysian Airlines flight that they? Because surely, like the rush, like the Kremlin wasn't like shoot because they, what it brought upon them was shocking. Surely, if they could get their hands on something like this, because they have this opinion of just kill all Ukrainians. It, like, I'm not saying the Russian military has this, but some of those militia groups on both sides have a absolute idea of creating a genocide against the people that they're against. Yeah, but as it, so the, the key thing to, with, with that, with what Andrew said, is once a genie is out of the bottle, you can't bring it back. Yeah. And Putin's also got firsthand knowledge of what had happened in Syria. Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I firmly believe that the world would look a lot different today if uh, President Obama had of followed through with his red line threat. When he said, you know, this is my red line, if, um, this, if Assad uses chemical weapons in Syria... And he had to back that up with military force. Um, I think the world would look a lot different to what it uh, it does today. Um, and I'm not alone in that. There's quite a few scholars that have, have um, think along those lines. Yeah. But, you know, even with the, the uh, Malaysian Airlines, and they've just had that court case recently, what's it cost Russia? No one's been arrested. You know, they've, got, they've named three guys, but they're still living in Russia. You know, there's some sanctions, but... Really, like, even what did it cost Assad? What what is everyone knows that you know Putin backed Assad and Assad fired sarin against his people in you know 2013 and 14, but he's still running Syria. So um, Putin analyzes all this, and so does the world. And really, um, unless there is some sort of reaction and, and uh, cause and effect, that's to me one of the um, what makes this threat more realistic? And, and if you look at his scale, he keeps talking about a nuclear attack. And we see it in North Korea. Every time North Korea is starving and need money or something, they fire a few missiles towards Japan and everyone starts talking rhetoric. And then they get more money from the UN. Don't fire missiles. We'll, we'll give you humanitarian aid. Um, so you've got to sometimes look at the second and third order effects of why they're doing it, why they're saying it, or conversely, um, what would happen post it. And in a lot of those contested areas now, um, if he used, um, and I guess we'll get into it when we start talking about radiological and, bio and, and nuclear, but some of these um, weapons have an effect of hundreds of years. You know, you said before you went to Chernobyl, that's still unlivable. So what would be the point of using one of these weapons in an area if you can't have it anyway? So, uh, and... Um, you know, all the uh, intelligence reporting um, is pretty um, confirmatory to say that those um, 
you know, separatist forces really do take their orders from, from Russia. So when I say they're not going rogue, you know, th they don't have a, um, you know, they're not trying to make a caliphate. They're not trying to uh, force their ideological views and values on uh, the population. They view themselves as Russian and, um, you know, Russia's a motherland. So, yeah. Yeah. And and before we get too sidetracked, Andrew, can you break down, um, I guess, the, the B in this, the uh, uh, potential of biological weapons? Sure. Uh, just to round out the, the chemical side of it, mm. to bring in a couple of other aspects in the unconventional asymmetric behind enemy lines kind of context. Chemical weapons were used to attempt to assassinate people in the UK in the last few years. Um, and for me, I look at it and go, why would you not just shoot them? Because it's not a guarantee that you're going to kill someone necessarily. It depends on how you deliver it how much you deliver over how long do they have decontamination to that medical support, et cetera. Same, same with groups like um, the Japanese cold umption Rikyo who used VX in 94 and sarin in 95. So the sarin release in the um, subway was containers with material in it and released into the air with sharpened umbrellas that they poked holes in the bags and it was just a natural release. Now, it turns out that that's a very inefficient way <clears throat> to get a, a high concentration of sarin in that closed environment. So they didn't really have the effect that they were looking for. So in the unconventional sense of employing chemical weapons in, in the Ukraine context, it would be more of a political, um, hey, look what we can do. It, it doesn't sound like something that would be used like, oh, there's, there's um, Zelensky let's target him with our little homemade chemical bomb. It might not even work. You know, it's not, it's not, that doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like a right fit, but certainly terrorizing the population, sending a message that, hey, we can do this. You can't stop us, whether that's a Spetsnaz thing or a, um, you know, a Wagner group rear, rear area action is a possibility. In terms of conventional employment of chemical weapon systems by air, by drone, by artillery, whatever it is, um, Yes, in the in the eastern region where they're where they're fighting to deny some area to attrit Ukraine forces to um, there's a couple of reasons why they could. I think that that's less likely than than some of the op other options that they've got. But certainly, if they've got it, there's a potential there that they could employ it tactically to achieve some tactical things, buy some time, deny some areas, attrit some forces. You know create some psychological fear in your enemy. No one's been wearing respirators until now. So you introduce some, um, some inhalation or some uh, absorption hazards, chemical hazards into the environment. I don't know if you've ever done those operations where you have to wear mop gear for more than an hour. It's horrible. Everything gets degraded. Your, your vision, your hearing, your ability to operate anything that has buttons and dials and all the rest of it. So if you force your enemy into that posture, that could be a big advantage to buy you some time to really slow that conflict down. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you mentioned in that, that, you know, they released VX gas with sharpened umbrellas. Um, where did they get something like that? Like, is there a potential black market for stuff like this? They made it. So the VX attack was actually an assassination of one of the cult members who they uh, suspected was a spy. So the VX was used just to kill him. That was 94, I believe. 95, they manufactured sarin. Um, they did a lot of testing in Australia. They brought up some lands. They were developing things, testing things. They made a lot of VX, made a lot of sarin, some other bits and pieces. Um, and that's what they were employing was that they had smart people. They had a lot of uh, resources in, in their organization um, and they made it and employed it on their own. So had they got the delivery system better, it would have been you know, it, it was already a horrible event, but it could have been a lot more lethal. Yeah, so what they were counting on is using the subway. So when the, obviously, if you've been in a, a subway, when the trains come, there's that massive rush of wind. Mm. That's what they were hoping for the delivery system. The trains had moved the, the sand around uh, and they just had poor timing and, and there was no trains, which kept it very local. But if, if uh, they had have got the timing with that train movement right, um, that, that's what they were, they were hoping. But but I guess uh, from an Australian context, the key was all their research and development was done in, in Bar One Station in WA. 
Right. And why was it done there? Because they could get away with it. No one was watching them. You know, they not by targeting Japan and not doing it in Japan, the Japanese government weren't looking at them. And, you know, Barwon Station in Western Australia is in the middle of nowhere, essentially. It wasn't until much later that they found about 200 dead cows. And they did some uh, examination of those cows and then they did some research on who had been renting the station that they realised what was going on and put, you know, one and one together. But, um, yeah, so... Um, that's and to answer your question where do they learn all that from they had some very smart people but they actually uh developed those those tactics and that um that uh training in australia yeah right okay well if that rounds out chemical um if, if it does um we move on to i guess uh, the biological aspect of this for sure so to to lead us into bio now of all the the, the three classes you really call them three nuke and radiological share a lot of language and terms. Um, biological is something that I'm not that um, strong in. I don't have a lot of background in it. I know enough to know that I'm not strong in it. So I don't want to talk too much out of turn, but the, the, you have to understand that bio covers a massive range of different um, things. Viruses are different from bacteria. They're different from, you know, C and D and on and on it goes. There's some main groups. It's it's easier to think of them in terms of lethality, uh, incubation period, transmissibility. Are they lethal and contagious? Are they non-lethal but contagious? Are they lethal but not contagious? So different biological threats were developed for different employment reasons. You know, ricin's very good as an assassination style uh, bio threat versus anthrax you know we had the 2001 anthrax um letters posted around dc so it depends again on what are you trying to achieve there, there's been a lot of development the soviets did a lot of bioweapon development that i think they had the biggest program um the ability to weaponize something in in a lot of circles that's referred to as putting it in a conventional military delivery system so rocket mortar bomb etc so same with chem with bio you have to be careful that you don't destroy the agent that you're trying to disseminate so it's usually just enough energetic material to spread the droplets or the powder or whatever it is over an area and that's sort of your conventional uh, biological weapon use and i guess you you one it's psychological again two you're using it to kill people if you can uh, and three, it's certainly sending that that message. That's that's the conventional side. Again, I don't know what Russia has uh, from Soviet days. I don't know what they've been working on. Um, probably something. The unconventional side, though, um, it, it's still we're in the the wide range of bios. There's a bunch of bio things that can be used to introduce into a society uh, with extremely low attribution because of these. Um, extended incubation periods, you can't say like chem, right? Hey, a mortar exploded over there. There was a funny colored cloud um, and Sarah in the field just dropped dead, right? That's a very short, you know, succinct event versus someone introducing plague or something like that into a society, um, poisoning water sources, things like that. It has a much longer flash to bang and therefore a much higher deniability for whoever's doing it. And these, again, are all behind enemy lines type ones. You wouldn't want to be employing this on a forward line. One, it's not going to have an immediate effect necessarily, that kind of tactic. And two, if these are people that that you've you know claimed as your own citizens part of Russia, you don't want to be giving them all you know the plague or smallpox, for example. Um, so that's sort of my initial thoughts. I don't know, Shane, if you wanted to jump in with anything. Yeah, so um, uh, when I was looking at Syria, um, Syria, the Syrian government had a, a, a large biological weapons research uh, facility, and mainly what they were trying to do is weaponize ricin or another toxin and then put it into rockets in order to fire it into Israeli water sources. Um, and the problem they were having there is the rocket would get to a temperature that would uh, neutralize the biological agent. So um, there is a lot of um, 
are indeed done because some of the um, toxins that they use are very temperamental with the delivery systems. That's at a state level. At a um, non-state level, one of the key threats, if I was, if you were going to use uh, a bio weapon, um, and I hate to to say it and, and let the um, let the um, what are they called the tin foil hat bloke say is, is if you look at what COVID did, it shut the shut the countries down. So what you would do is you would use a bio uh, toxin and you would use um, whether it be special operations or, or some sort of agents to uh, deliver it into the food source of a country. And, you know, even as simple as give, have a mass outbreak of um, gastro and all of a sudden your health centers are overwhelmed. You know, if you think about even Sydney or Brisbane or Adelaide, if overnight there was 300 people turned up at, at some of the hospitals with terrible gastro and vomiting, those hospitals are going to get shut down pretty quick. And so straight away, you're starting to really affect a country's ability uh, to govern. And that is at a, at a um, strategic and a tactical level. That's what a bioweapon would be used for as a let's introduce a toxin into a population as a preeminent uh a, um, offensive weapon prior to an invasion. So let's say that, uh, or even in as the Russians are pulling back, they poison all the food sources. So as the Ukrainians go into those areas and start looking at livestock or you know food to eat, then they all start getting food poisoning. And, and that's at a basic level, but that's exactly what uh, a lot of the bioweapons are used for. You know, uh, tularemia and the plague and things like this. They don't have to be that um, um, sophisticated in order to, you know, if you look at World War One, even in Gallipoli, there were more um, Australian deaths from gastro than there were from bullets. Nothing, you know, the Civil War, some of those battles, um, there were uh, higher casualty rates of guys with um, dysentery than actually bullets. And, and that's what bio... Um, that's the big threat to bio is in, in, in this time where you've got moving flots or, you know, forward line of troops, uh, the, the front lines will say, if they leave behind or they poison water sources, um, you know, we saw, uh, and there's a lot of reporting, and you can really speak to this, Willie, having spent a lot of time in the front line, uh, the Russian troops aren't that, that well fed. Uh, and so it, it wouldn't be hard uh, or as they're pulling out of an area, poison some water sources, Ukrainians move in, they get sick, and then the Russians can retake quite easily because the, the Ukrainian fighting force isn't that effective because they, they, they've you know got, got stomach bugs. So that's the real threat from bio rather than firing, you know, putting a ton of rice in a rocket and firing. But even at, at that level, that, what the Syrians were trying to do with their state program was contaminate the, the Israeli water source so when they were drinking, they were drinking and getting sick. And I think something, and I guess, Shane, you can speak on this more so than myself, but Russia loved the element of plausible deniability. That That's something that at least that I've seen in so many cases from the Novichok or whatever it's pronounced in the UK through to a lot of incidents. They like an element of, well, maybe it wasn't them that there isn't a smoking gun. Like you said, why wouldn't you shoot them? Because then there's a, a literal smoking gun. They like that element of pause but not deniability. And if, oh, 10 cows have fallen in this water source, you can't, you, you might be able to say, well, we 99% know it is them, but maybe it's not. So I guess, does that bring in the, the element of plausible deniability more so of the biological weapons over a long period of, oh, we handed this, this region back, everyone's getting sick. Well, that's nothing to do with us. We gave it back to you. Yeah, exactly right. It, and that's it, that's exactly um, why the bio threat at a is in a lot of ways more um, dangerous than a chemical threat because you're exactly right. You know, how, how do you prove that it wasn't food poisoning? How do you prove that you know the Ukrainians just didn't start? slaughtering a few cows or they saw some dead cows and they haven't had fresh meat for a while. 
and, and then you know that that to me is a more re realistic and and then you're right because even if the ukrainians um were able to get some samples out of you know stool samples or whatever from their troops to go look all of these guys had x in our system you, you know putin goes well we didn't give it to them prove it you know so um you know just um you know some of the the soviet or russian programs you know anthrax played um q fever and botulism you know they've got state-run programs and stockpiles just of those toxins which are just found in the environment you know um, a lot of people don't realize that anthrax naturally is found so um i think you you you're right on the money with that plausible deniability in the, the bio space um and it can really as we've seen with covid um um shut shut a country or a fighting force down you know you can imagine you know the ukrainians are on the, the on the front foot they're making ground they're moving into areas and then you know half of their half of their frontline troops in that area go down with a stomach bug hmm. even that 42 72 hours while they recover from that that gives time for a the russians to regroup consolidate but then get onto a counteroffensive, noting that a lot of the troops in front of them are sick yeah yeah um unless there's anything else on bio i guess we'll move on to i guess what has Harder the to most has... too yeah and but... the other thing is I... with um with mm. chemical <clears throat> you know you've got like it's an m9 paper coey that you put in your boots and um that that tape is that yeah m8 yep. m9 <clears throat> yeah so it's literally just a tape you can put on your boots or you've got your detectors that you can stand off uh or carry on you that will pick up chemical agents in the atmosphere you don't have that in bio a lot of the times you won't know that there's been a bio a quote-unquote attack until guys are crook and that what's what makes it more dangerous with a you know you can have these the chemical detectors that you can put right down range and they go off and you you know a couple of kilometers you get you know you've got plume modeling you look at the weather effects there's a whole heap of um mitigation strategies in, in a chemical space all goes out the window in bio and you don't know a lot of the time that that there's been a, a, a quote unquote bio attack until your guy your troops are sick yeah yeah just to tie into that one willie as well a lot of these things there's no such thing as a naturally occurring vx airburst event right whereas ebola is active in africa right things like cholera there are still cholera outbreaks you know smallpox sure technically it's been wiped out but there's a couple of places on earth officially where it exists one of them's in russia so getting things that could occur naturally as outbreaks etc and in, uh, inserting them into that environment uh, behind enemy lines is certainly an option and a very deniable option the closer it is to your own troops you're then running a risk there of getting taken down by the same action um but but certainly it's possible yeah and something i want to point out and this is more from a journalist point of view and i guess i don't ask for you guys to comment on this uh because it is purely speculation but in my opinion and experience where i think you may be incorrect on some of this is I don't see that the Russians really give a shit about a lot of their mm. soldiers. Uh, and that's something that I've seen again and again and again in being in frontline areas that have been um, liberated by the Ukrainians and seeing how the Russians were living. They were left there. They were just fucking left there to die. Uh, or, you know, and oh, there's so many cases. Oh, they've just left guys there. They've just switched off their radios and, oh, fuck you. Yeah. And one part of me in this, and we talk about, you know, oh, we don't want to do that. You wouldn't want to expose your troops. I think we might be putting too much of like a Western mindset on would Russia, and I don't want to seem like a tinfoil hat asshole, but would they really care if there were a few hundred troops that were infected with something or carrying something and, hey, go that way and, you know, fight the war. And they don't even know they've infected with it or whatever. I don't, I, and I don't, I don't believe that they, they do. They're giving guys body armor plates that are not ballistic rated at all it's a plastic or a steel but it's not going to stop shit they're giving pre-world war one weapons you know and this is all to me signs of we don't care if you live or die same as the recruiting from the far east or far northern parts of russia where 
there's an element of, oh, these aren't Moscovite Russians. We don't care. Like my, one thing that I'd like to stress in that is personally, and I'm from no background like you guys, I think that the, the idea of, or oh, they won't want to kill their own guys with this is maybe, maybe falsified. And maybe that buys into this, um, well, I think that's an deniability point. as well. Yeah, I think it's, that's it's an incidental. And I agree 100%. And that's going to also perfectly tie into when we start talking about radiological. Yeah. I think yeah. it's incidental. I think I think they haven't done it. They haven't done chem. They haven't done bio. They haven't done nuke rad. The reasons why they haven't could be because they can't. They don't have the skill. They don't have the materials. They are not allowed. Maybe. They've been told, not yet. We're saving it. Um, an incidental factor is, oh, well, that's good we haven't used those because then we haven't killed any of our own blokes. That's not the primary reason why they haven't used them. There's right. there's b other big drivers, and it's probably if they've got them and they're, they're there, they're getting held for a reason. Mm. Yeah, um, and, and I think there's definitely, and we'll, I, we'll get to, into this a bit later well, after we do nuke, but on this... So I'll give you. Just we don't bit, want to give NATO a reason to put more money, more weapons into Ukraine, or NATO get involved. Russia need to tow for for Russia to have an effect. They need to tow the line. They they need and they're fucking towing the line. But if they do have something that has no deniability, well, NATO are going to, in my opinion, have some reason to be involved or reason to go. We're signing another fifty billion dollars. And that's, I guess, what they don't want. But I don't believe it's to not harm their own guys. It's to stop NATO coming. No, no. And, and you know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll finish how the Spanish um, colonised Southern America was through smallpox. And it wasn't deliberate. Just the locals, the Aztecs and that weren't used to. And the same thing happened in Australia when the first fleet landed with the Indigenous uh, nations here, they they were inadvertently affected with disease from Western countries. I think they so, were called cooties, mate, weren't they? <laughs> but so you, you could have some of those Russian troops that are wounded could have or be given some sort of pathogen or disease that the Ukrainians inadvertently bring into their health system um, or to treat. So, yeah, I, and I think what you just said about them not caring about their soldiers is 100% accurate and... Um, will really tie into how they could possibly deliver a radiological source. Yeah. Okay. And to move, we'll move on to nuclear weapons. And I guess nuclear has... Can we go rad then nuke? We can go rad then nuke if you'd like. I, th I think rad will be quite quick to be yeah. honest, Shane. Yeah. That's why. Okay. Okay. Well, let, we'll move on to radiological weapons. And, and I've been learning about this in myself because I always thought that radiological was from nuclear fallout but that is well in incorrect in the sense of this term if i am correct if shane you could speak on that or both of you uh, so, so um there's a couple of things with with rad or radiological radioactive material there's um a source that gets carried through a population inadvertently or deliberately and anyone within uh, a proximity of that source gets affected through dosage, which there's a great example in uh, South America where a couple of guys went to an old hospital and found some radiological sources uh, from an old x-ray machine. They were glowing. They thought, this is awesome. Let's take them home. And they infected everyone in their village. And, you know, they all died from uh, radiological exposure. Um, and that that whole village is, is um, in a, a habitual for hundreds of years. So there's an... Um, when we're moving in and out of some of these Russian areas, if they've got medical facilities, there's going to be legacy radioactive material and sources within them that can be um, used or gathered um, not intentionally, which hasn't been spoken about a lot. But as far as um, intentionally, say a separatist group making a... Uh, Dirty bomb and IED. I'm going to turn over to Andrew, the expert on that one. So there's a there's a few things, and radiation can be quite a confusing one in terms of the MBCD threat or the CBRN threat. 
So radiation is naturally occurring, right? The sun is basically a gigantic fusion machine. It's fuse, fusing together lots and lots of hydrogens and making helium, releasing heaps and heaps of energy, right? That's, that's the simplest form of um, nuclear energy that's occurring. There are all sorts of things that emit radiation. So in the terms of nuclear, we're talking about the fuels for fission, for example, is uranium, plutonium that's been enriched. And it gets very, you can get very technical into all that sort of stuff, which we'll cover in nuke. Then there's a bunch of other naturally radioactive materials that have uses. So some examples are cobalt-60, uh, cesium, um, californium, there's a few, right? And they naturally occur and naturally emit radiation. They can be made as well in a, in a nuclear facility. And they're generally used for things like, traditionally they were used for things like x-raying, um, for treatment of cancers, for um, other different applications where you want a supply of um, radiation energy to do something with. So back in the day, they used to paint aircraft needles on, on altimeters and stuff like that with radium, right? So it's a, a, um, it's a radioactive paint, more or less. They didn't know really the effects back in the day. So what you can do to make a dirty bomb, a dirty bomb is simply um, a collection of radioactive materials, dust, whatever, whatever form it's in. Um, so there's things like x-ray cameras and they have little pellets and all sorts of different sources. Um, you, you get a, an amount and you distribute it, you, you atomize it over an area using explosive. So that material, which is emitting radiation. So in some cases, you know, things like cobalt and cesium, it's radioactive for some, some sources can be radioactive for days. Others could be radioactive for weeks, months, some years. So a source's half-life is how long it takes that radioactive material to halve in energy output. So different applications of radioactive material require different half-lives. You have different storage arrangements, all that sort of stuff. If you can find and get hold of from, as Shane said, hospitals, from x-ray machinery that use sources, um, that radiologically emitting material that when exposed outside of a containment environments such as a lead containment vessel radiates people right so you atomize or you vaporize distribute the radioactive material over an area wherever it lands whatever organic is near it a farm animal a person etc they get uh, incidentally radiated by that material and that contamination will, will sit on the ground for a long time broadly speaking so you can have a, an effect on an area where you don't need to be a nuclear physicist. You just need to get hold of the sources and you need to build a way of disseminating that over whatever area you're trying to do it. Um, modern X-ray systems are called X-ray generators. So they use uh, another method of producing uh, radiation that once you turn it off, take the battery off, that, it, that no radiation comes out of it. So that's the difference between X-ray generators and X-ray sources. Uh, sources are highly controlled. They are tracked. They, you know, well, in Western countries, they're supposed to be. They do go missing. They, there are reports of them. You know, they used to drop them out. The Soviets used to drop them out of aircraft in the middle of nowhere and use them as navigation beacons, right? Knowing that it wasn't going to radiate anyone because it was in the middle of nowhere and they fly over it at 30,000 feet. So that's that's a dirty bomb in a nutshell. It's not a traditional weapon system. This is purely an asymmetric terrorist type system, a, a crude way of irradiating an area with radioactive materials. Yes. And am I wrong if I say even our ACOG sites on our weapons had a radiation? Like, wasn't the beam inside of them? A small bit of I'm not I'm not sure. There's a lot of things yeah. that it used to be in, like uh, old smoke smoke alarms, smoke detectors. Yeah, they used to have small radiation sources. That there's X-ray cameras. There, there's a there's a raft of stuff. Um, yeah, you know, without wanting to go into you know a list of websites and stores that you should go to to <laughs> buy it. <laughs> of course, yes. Have you guys heard the? Just on a quick side note, have you heard the story of the glowing women? No. So in a town in America, uh, they were very famous for making watches in, I think it's the 50s or 60s. And they used to have, because well, women had smaller hands to paint the dials on that. 
and it was painted with a um, a uh, radiological source. And because it glowed, they used to paint their teeth in their jewelry with it, and they'd go out at night to nightclubs, and their teeth would be glowing. And over the years, they were getting radiological poison, and they all end up dying of cancer. And, um, but for about three or four years, it was a fashion trend to paint your teeth in that with this fluoro green radiological source. Yeah, right. Yeah. But so just, uh, I, I just want to touch on and ask Andrew um, a couple of questions about the dirty bomb. So one of the limitations and uh, issues when making a dirty bomb or dealing with radiological, and, and that's why I kind of spoke about that story, you can contaminate yourself. So if you just can't go and pick up a radiological source in, you know, in your 5.11s or whatever genes and carry it to your warehouse and start making, uh, put it on the table as you're making your IED and it's there, it's going to admit off rad and you're going to absorb that radiological and, and get sick, right? You're going to get burnt and, and die. So it's actually got to be put in uh, something to shield it, which is normally lead. Um, and, you know, depending on the size of the source, depending on how big the, the lead, you know, pig is or container is. Um, so if you can't actually physically get to the radiological source and you've got to strap that IED next to that container that's housing the source, part of what makes a uh, RDD or a dirty bomb specific, and if I stretch too far, Andrew, jump in, you've actually got to drive part of the IED through that um, container to ensure that it does disperse the radiological source because there are times where that doesn't happen, something blows up, but the source is intact in its container, correct? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at it and it's really about what are you trying to achieve? So dirty bombs, if, if you've got a one-way ticket, <clears throat> You may go for a more powerful radiological source. You have a much reduced time frame in which to assemble the device and initiate it simply because your body is just being destroyed by radiation. It's the cells are just being destroyed by that radioactive energy. Um, I Smaller sources and more of them that emit less radiation are more usable. Um, you know, if you, if you don't necessarily want to be a suicide dirty bomb employer, um, again, I you've got to protect yourself where you can. It's hard to do for the high strength sources. You can assemble the device and the materials inside, say a lead line briefcase or something like that, which will provide some protection, but building and employing a dirty bomb is, is not a long-term career. Certainly as well, when it comes to the effects of radiation, it doesn't, if you, if you've got a lot of, uh, lower strength sources that you're trying to disperse over an area, you may not necessarily kill anyone in the short term. So what Shane was referring to before was a radiological exposure device, RED. That's putting a very high power source hidden somewhere in a community and just irradiating people over a long time, killing them by radiation poisoning. Now, that same sort of concept, if you spread radioactive materials over an area, it's the inhalation of that dust that's really going to do a lot of damage over longer periods to the population. So as a weapon system, as a, what am I trying to achieve by using a dirty bomb? That is a fear, um, a, a look at what we can do, you know, look at what we're doing to your population kind of maneuver. Again, not, not all that technically difficult to do if you can get hold of the sources and you survive long enough to employ it properly. Um, but what are you trying to achieve? So it would be a huge political, psychological uh, thing to employ a dirty bomb in, say, Kiev. Um, that is a massive statement, you know. So can they do it? Pro possibly, probably. Um, there's got to be a reason, if they can do it, why they haven't done it yet. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll tie all this up from an intelligence perspective before we move into nuke. What the intelligence agencies uh, and even us that are watching from the sidelines are looking for indicators and warnings. So for all three, Ken, New, uh, Ken Bio and RAD, we're intelligence agencies will be looking primarily 
um, that they would have monitors up. Now, a lot of Europe is actually, because of the Cold War, has uh, radiological soil monitors up that do take samples of air and wind and, and weather patterns. Um, they'd be looking, uh, doing the same thing in the chem space. They'd be monitoring hospitals. And so when we spoke about bio with, uh, with infectious disease and that, they'd be looking for trends. If all of a sudden in a certain area, X amount of people uh, arrive in a short period of time with either some burns or uh, a certain um, ailment, they'd be, well, where did that come from? So the counter to this is uh, the massive collection effort by intelligence agencies uh, out there looking for, uh, you know, if you're looking at in the chemical space, where are they getting precursors um, in, in volume? And, and there's a lot of organizations that monitor this um, daily, you know, globally uh, for, for that threat. Uh, so why we've been talking about what is required if a uh, if Russia or uh, one of their non-state groups was to try to employ one of these uh, agents or devices? Um, there is a lot of groups and organisations out there that monitor this on a daily basis, and they have very specific and accurate indicators and warnings uh, across the board that those analysts are looking at um, daily spikes in. Um, uh, health standards, measuring the wind, the weather, um, you know, theft, uh, a whole heap of things. So um, I just want to put that out there before we move into, because nuclear is really a big state problem. Uh, these three are both state and non-state. When I say non-state, your separatist groups or your terrorism groups. Um, but um, me and Andrew are, are familiar with a lot of these processes because We've also studied it from the threat perspective. Are our adversaries uh, able to achieve this? And if they are, what do they need to do it? And the reason that we know that there's a lot more people around the world that are looking at these things on a daily basis. Yeah, right. Well, does that finish? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just one more thing. Sorry, Willie. Um, I, I really look at a lot of these threats in terms of um, what's known. I don't know of any successful state or otherwise uh, radiological dirty bomb attack ever. I've never heard of it. Um, that says to me, if it's never been done and you've got some extremely committed terrorist organizations out there, um, why? It's either too hard to do, uh, they keep dying while they're trying, it's being monitored, combination, but there's reasons why it's never happened before. And that gives me some hope that it won't happen. Yeah, you would think if it was as easy as finding some old um, bloody smoke alarms and some old um, needles out of an aeroplane, then it, you know, to break down. And if you're a suicide bomber anyway, why would it, why would it matter? But yeah, I guess you, the proof's in the pudding when you say, well, no one's been able to do it, then there must be something as well. Absolutely. Um, I can see the comments now going, Willie's just desperate to move on to nuclear. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but I guess this is the one that trends the best in the media because it's the the most infamous, I guess, and the most, if I want it, for the use of a poor word, but the most sexy to make a story about because you can put a picture of a nuclear bomb or, and we've got evidence of what happened when the Americans dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan. Um, so I guess these trends the best and we have, I guess, some idea, a better idea of the capability of Russia. And at least in my limited knowledge, and that's why I've got you know two experts on, Russia has, you know, there's been so many capabilities we've seen in this war that we're like, well, we thought Russia had this and they didn't or they do and the T whatever tank sucks or it doesn't run or this plane isn't stealth, whatever. We've seen a lot of that. But I think it's been fairly well documented that Russia does have a massive, you know, nuclear weapons program and the capability to deliver one of those or multiple warheads anywhere in the world, anytime they wanted, if, you know, the buttons were pushed on this. And I think that's why the threat of that and through the, the mad tree, the mutually assured destruction is so threatening to people because we know that if one gets fired, the world seemingly, and the, it seemingly could end overnight. Um, and I guess that's why it trends 
the most through the media, even though it may be the least likely of these, it's seemingly the media is picking it up as the most likely to happen. And in my opinion, Russia does not want, they throw the, and Donald Trump says this, he throws the N word out there again, the nuclear word, you know, Putin throws the nuclear word out there. It, it's because it probably has a massive psychological effect that Shane, you could talk on of, well, we know they've got this capability. Um, and we know the devastating effect of this, but is Russia wanting to use one and then end their own country through NATO being involved? Probably not. It's probably the least likely. Um, but I guess, Andrew, if you could start and talk us through uh, the, the nuclear weapons, their threats, and, and how it could actually happen. For sure. Uh, again, this is one of those topics. Um, I sound like I'm trying to get out of talking too much technical stuff, but nuclear physics is, it sounds hard because it is hard. Um, but to, to, to go through the basics um, and just enough so that we can sort of get into the, the application of it, nuclear energy has been around for a while. We've only really had two nuclear weapons ever used uh, back in World War II. Never had any radio, radiological dirty bomb weapons used. Had some bio attacks, but not in the conventional set. Had a lot more chemical attacks and conventional ordnance. Lots and lots and lots and lots. So that that tier of it's because it's harder to do. It has a much greater effect. It's riskier. It costs more. All these kinds of things play into what weapon system to use, when to use it, why to use it. So. A nuclear weapon, and there's they refer them as tactical nukes, you know, strategic nukes. A nuclear weapon is always always has an international effect. You cannot employ a nuclear weapon without there being one. So, tactical nuclear weapon just refers to a lower kiloton yield versus a massive ICBM, you know, high output yield. There's two types of nuclear weapons. Broadly speaking, you have fission and fusion. So, fission is where you're splitting apart. Um, nuclear material, fissile material, the, and the two most um, talked about ones, or the two main ones, I should say, plutonium, but more widely uranium. So you need to get to what's called a critical mass, and they enrich uranium, um, which I won't go into. It's a process of, of making the material um, a certain usable way. Once it's it goes into the weapon system, it's the process of splitting each of those atoms that releases energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the splitting process releases more energy and allows more splitting processes to occur, and hence the term chain reaction. Right? It just keeps going and going and going. So that's that's fission, where you're splitting apart. <clears throat> then you have fusion, where you're fusing together two light items, and it's helium is what you fuse together. So that's why they're often called hydrogen bombs versus nuclear um, bombs. So fusing together releases energy, but you need a massive amount of heat and other energy to fuse the two together. And often fusion weapon systems are initiated by very, very small fission explosions. So you can imagine the complexity that goes into building something like this, you know, enriching your fuel, designing the system, all the rest of it. They've been doing it for years. It's, it can get very complicated you know, the, the, the method by which it's, it's triggered the, the brains of it, it very complicated, um, been done over decades. The end state is it, it has the advantages of being a conventional explosive. That's the effect it produces, right? A lot of thermal energy, a lot of blast over pressure, picks up fragmentation from everywhere, throws it around. It also creates electromagnetic pulse. It creates instantaneous um, radiation, as well as irradiating the soil and anything else that comes into that immediate um, area of effect. And that's what the giant mushroom clouds are when you have these surface, subsurface um, detonations of nuclear weapons. It's picking up all that dust from the ground into that huge mushroom cloud, and everything that's in that mushroom cloud becomes irradiated. So it becomes a, a radiation emitter itself. And that's what creates these huge areas of fallout that are basically unlivable for a long time. Uh, different weapons produce different amounts of energy on based on their size but if you were to employ a, even a tactical nuclear weapon th that's it there's no taking it back that you know that that is it done ruined that area for our lifetimes the only exception i'll say is there are forms of employment of 
nuclear weapons such as airburst where there's no there it doesn't touch the surface and it so you're getting the effect from emp and radiation so there are circumstances where you'd employ one of these over a city you'd you'd kill all the people and you'd destroy a lot of the electrical infrastructure but you're not a rate there's no there's none of the fallout because it hasn't picked up any of the dust or debris from the ground so that's that's a slightly different take on employment of a nuclear weapon um, but that's it in a nutshell it's really one of those estates have this stuff it's very complicated to make um, the the choice of employing it as you said this is the last resort you push that button nobody knows what's going to happen but it's not going to be good mm. shane can you speak on i guess the intelligence of yeah, so, monitoring uh, these and how they are and and maybe what Russia's real capabilities, if you've got any say on that? So um, first thing is, as Andrew and you both alluded to, they're not new. So obviously they've been around, you know, 40s um, and have been employed. The Cold War was about uh, essentially building up their arsenals and scientists. Um, and what kept the world safe was that mutually assured destruction. We're going to know that you fired your bombs in enough time for us to fire ours. And so therefore, what's the point of you firing yours? Because we're still going to have time to fire ours. And if you go back to the 60s, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that's what that was about. The Russians were countering. So the US put uh, nuclear weapons into Turkey, uh, being a NATO ally, because it was only a very short distance uh, into Russia. The Russians countered that by trying to put... Um, New, small uh, tactical nuclear weapons into Cuba being 90 miles to attack America. And uh, a lot of people say that's the closest we've ever come to a nuclear war was that May 1962 of the Cuban Missile Crisis. But again, that was about cutting the time and space down from launch to strike because of that mutually assured destruction. The problem we have in today is hypersonic flight. And this has been the uh, next level of technical achievement that China, Russia, America, and a few other countries have been trying to achieve. Because if you can achieve hypersonic flight with a nuclear weapon, then mutually assured destruction's out the window. You do not have the time to counter that that um, that that strike, and the. Um, I say theory, but a lot of analysts are saying that there are a number of countries, Russia being one, that have achieved um, hypersonic flight with their uh, ICBMs. Uh, and um, that's a game changer as far as taking that mutually assured destruction out. Um, there's uh, some other capabilities. You know, the Americans are the only ones who can fire uh, nuclear weapons from submarines that can actually do it underwater where... Soviets have got to come to the surface, so then therefore they're a target. Um, but uh, that's what the arms race was about. You know, um, once you've got five or six nuclear weapons, you can essentially take a, a country out. Why do you need a thousand of them? Um, but as far as the threat of a nuclear attack uh, in um, the Ukraine by Putin, if you look at what is Putin's motivation? If you look at his address in 2000, when he first took over as president, he said then very clearly he was going to reestablish the mother Russia. When Ukraine's a big part of that. He was never a fan of Boris Yeltsin giving Ukraine its independence. And that was because Yeltsin was Ukrainian. Uh, and so uh, uh, Putin's always had this... Ukraine is part of Russia and that's what he's motivating and that's what he wants his legacy to be now so if you take that in a context what is his motivation to use nuclear weapons on an area that he deems to be his um, if nothing more than just to say that I won but if he and I agree with Andrew there's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon every nuclear weapon is strategic you know, it's got to be approved at the highest levels of government and it's a game changer. It's not like, oops, some bloke just, you know, hit fire in that little nuke 
it's it's a game changer. And um, I think that um, he uses, same as we're seeing in North Korea, they use nuclear threat as a way to get something else. It's Putin's biggest chip. Every time he's, uh, you know, there's negative press, his army's taking a uh, lost a battle or something, he starts firing at the nuclear rhetoric and everyone starts reporting about, you know, we're getting close to a nuclear a war and that gives him more leverage at a negotiation table. Uh, and if you, if we're if we're being honest, the only countries that the, the US negotiate with are nuclear countries. That's why they're so scared of Iran becoming nuclear, because apart from the fact that their whole, their greatest enemy is Israel, and and that's what that issue is about, but the fact that um, America would have to negotiate and deal with Iran on a much different scale. Um, and if you know if you if you think about if the uh, the other thing that's not very reported is in the Clinton administration, they did a deal of the US would always support and defend Ukraine if Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons, which they did. Um, it's not reported about much because the Democrats are in office in America, but uh, Bill Clinton signed a mutually um, assurance pact with uh, Yeltsin and Ukraine that if the Ukraine, because most of the Russian weapons at that point were in Ukraine, if the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons, the US would always defend Ukraine from a nuclear attack. And um, if my, um, if you Google that, you know, and I just double checked and I've reported on this previously, there's a big photo of, of Clinton and Yeltsin signing this, this pact in Kiev um, and um, the reason the Americans aren't talking about that because that supersedes NATO. So if um, Putin was to fire any form of nuclear device inside Ukraine, Zelensky could quite um, correctly in, enforce that that um, that pact signed between uh, Clinton and Yeltsin. Mm. But I get that. I guess that also asks the question of would it like a pact at the end of the day is a shake of hands and a we'll do this you know at the end of the day and this is my thoughts on this is if and this is me putting tinfoil hat on if russia dropped a nuclear weapon in ukraine on kiev would would Amer america would have to stand back and their thought process must be we've got this pact okay are we willing to end the world because that that's in my opinion, that that's the next decision. If if you fire back in retaliation to, you know, um, to uphold this pact that the Hilton government, you know, made, you are saying goodbye to the modern world as we see it. Now, of course, that is Putin who took the first step, but I think um, that would have to cross America's mind of holy shit. Yeah, I know this is bad. And it's just killed five million innocent Ukrainians. But if we do push this button, we're about to kill a billion people around the world in the next five hours. Got America have done it before, so um... yes. And, and this is, but this is Russia's thing, and I, and I don't disagree with when um, some of the Russian officials, who no matter what you think of them, say at the end of the day, the only country to have ever actually done this is America, and that is a, a very truthful statement. And they did it against non-military targets. So that's kind of not true. Uh, the, the analysis that the US government did was that the Japanese had just essentially militarized their entire population. And they looked at the battle losses that they'd already taken in Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And uh, then they looked at Japan had essentially, like I said, militarized their entire population. And if they invaded uh, Japan, as they had in their island hopping campaign, the loss of life would be X amount. Yes. And they thought, well, if we drop this, the loss of life is actually only this amount. And that yeah. would bring them to the table because one of the other things that the Japanese public had said is our life is to die and defend the, um, the um, what's the leader of, uh, the emperor of Japan, mm. who's divine. So that was that was literally the the 
essentially equation that the US president at that time had to had to weigh up. How many US lives w- will it take and coalition Australian lives it take invading Japan? Hmm. Will Japan what at what point will Japan surrender? And or what can we do to bring about that shorter? And if we're being completely honest, they wanted Russia to know that they had the bomb. Yes, absolutely. And, and I agree, and I've heard that. It was a really good, um, like, short documentary breaking down about, you know, the more lives were saved by those strikes than they took. But it's very contested. In, that but in that, in that hand, in, in the same hand, and trying not to be political at all, saying that, well, this saved more lives than it took, dropping a nuclear weapon in a war, could Putin not say, well, we dropped one here and killed... Because he could argue that the entire population of Ukraine has been, in a way, militarized. You know, weapons were handed out on the street in mass, and you know, no men can leave. Uh, and people, the, the Ukrainians, and Zelensky stated this many times, whether rightfully or wrongfully, it doesn't matter. And all the people I know there, my dear friends in Ukraine, say that there is no surrender; that they will fight till the last person, if needed. Could. Is, doesn't that have similar um, effect as what, what the Americans were saying? Couldn't he go, well, this was the way to save lives? I'm not saying he's right. In it. I'm saying, you know, personally, I think he's incredibly wrong by saying that. But if that were his reasoning, wouldn't that be very similar reasoning to the Americans? So, so true, but the difference we have in today compared to 1945 is the if if the if the... Another country had a nuclear weapon that could have retaliated to the US. Mm-hmm. That would have thrown another decision point that the POTUS would have had to consider before giving the approval to drop those bombs. But they, they knew that they were the only one that's, that had them. That's what makes Putin's decision much more complex. Yes. Is um, if we drop a nuclear device in anywhere in Ukraine for, these pur- for whatever purpose... Who's going to retaliate? And so America is not the only country that has that's opposing Ukraine, the Russia that has nuclear weapons. Yeah, France, you know? UK. Correct, right? And let's think of the the greater threat to especially France from Russia than the US. So the US, you know, we're across the pond, but the French, you know, well, hang on, like, is this history repeating itself again or, or whatever? So I think we're we're not. I always tell people to look at the whole board as a as a game of geopolitical chess. Mm-hmm. At the moment, too many people are just focusing on a couple of set pieces. You know, um, what is... And they're not looking three or four steps ahead. So what is the second and third order effect of um, Putin dropping, you know, a small-scale nuclear device in um, southern Ukraine in order to, you know, clear and hold or take any any form of ground. Right, straight away, there's going to be the global holy shit moment. He's done it. Um, we've already talked about his deniability. Hmm. Could he potentially say that some rogue generals did it without his approval? You know, would that be the initial rhetoric to hold off a retaliation? Um as I spoke about before, we've already seen in uh, 2014 when President Obama said he had a red line for chemical weapons and didn't react. Yes. Um, we haven't heard uh, the US kind of have any form of red line because they've learned from their past. If we say something, we've got to commit to it. They're, they're being very neutral in their dialogue, even as you said, um, with having to um, defend Ukraine and you know, that, that pact that was signed um, in um, 1994, it was signed, January 14, 1994. And it was because when the Soviet Union fell apart, a lot of the Soviet's weapons were in Ukraine. Mm. And so the US said, if you, you know, you, if you take out those, we'll support you if the new Russia ever threatens you. And that was signed between Clinton, Yeltsin, and the Ukrainian president, um, Kravak. You know, so there is, you know, and that was a strategic agreement signed for that. 
Um, and given it was Clinton and the Democrats, it, it, you know, it's not in any of the current uh, conversations or political points in the US because heaven forbid they, the Republicans being able to use that against a Democratic president. Uh, and I actually think that uh, Biden was in the um, Senate at the time that voted on that agreement. So, right. um, you know, would the Americans, or what would be the Americans' immediate, you know, as I like to talk, 10-metre target, 100-metre target, 300-metre target, um, for, for, you know, would they um, have to prove that Putin knowingly and willingly gave the order? Yeah. Um, hmm. Would they? Uh, would he stand up and go? Yes, I gave the order. You know, um, would it have to go to the UN for a vote? Would the Security Council become involved? There's been no clear path for what that decision process in any sort of um, retaliatory attack looks like, and I think that's by design because yes, no one in the West wants to paint themselves in a corner like Obama did in '14. Do you agree with that, Andrew? <clears throat> Look, I'm political situations like this is not, you know, I'm just expressing my personal opinion here, but um, certainly the military would refer to this situation as the, you know, the ultimate dilemma. So that, that everyone keeps saying how dangerous this period we're entering is because, because the Russia seems to be very cornered here. And they have been proven to, you know, have the ability to do certain things. So th there are lots of things at play here. If they decide to drop a small nuclear weapon on a big city or on a certain part, that puts the ball back, you know, in the Americans call, what, what, what does the West do? And it's, it's very hard to just stand there and watch this country you've supported for so long, watch it burn and not retaliate because they'll be expecting you to retaliate, but, but maybe that's, you know, you then have the power to allow nuclear war to unfold or to not. So that it's a very, very difficult, complicated situation. Uh, you know, what if the Russian economy collapses in three months just after winter and it, it breaks apart into different regions? What if they lose control of their nuclear weapons? What if there's a coup? What if, th There are so many dangerous things that could happen well, from this you point just, on. You've really come across something that um, we really need to, or, as in uh, anyone in the West analyzing this, coming into, we're about to come into winter in Germany and Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, we've got those gas supplies not going out, power, electricity, I think this is going to be the critical decision points for a lot of these countries of it's going to force everyone to the table purely out of economic hardship and population struggles. You know, will the, the Ukrainian population get to a point in halfway through, three quarters of the way through winter when they've got no electricity, no food, and say, look, fuck, you know, we're done, we're freezing and we're, we're starving? Um, is that what Putin's going to wait them out potentially? Um, you know, what's going to happen in Germany, given that they're, um, they're going to have heating issues and they're going to have uh, food issues. And um, I think that's the Putin uses the nuclear threat when he's trying to um, regain control of a diplomatic situation. So the fact that he's actually still pumping gas into Europe, which people don't really talk about, the fact that he is allowing grain supplies out of Ukraine into Africa, um, there's still, um, and as Andrew just alluded to, if he stops that or the West stop allowing that, the, the Russian economy is done. You know, um, gone. like the fact that they're not allowed to use US dollars and no one's taking the ruble at the moment, I think that um, that's more of the geopolitical chess game is going to play out over the next uh, four to six weeks, eight weeks as you get into winter proper. Um, and um, I just don't think 
Putin gains anything from anything from um, using a nuclear weapon, and I think he knows that. Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. Is there anything else on that, Andrew? You'd like to say? Not not overly. No, I think yeah. that's, that's pretty good. Um, yeah. Point to to leave it. Um. Just to run over this sheet, and I've got, I've been writing down some, if I've been looking down, it's not because I'm on my phone. I've been <laughs> writing down some notes as I've gone of things I've, I've thought about. But in this last point of things to, I guess, talk about, I think we've covered a lot of this, of the potential usage of um, CBRN within the environment and um, the consequences on terms of attack, um, as far as like difficulty, effectiveness, duration, risk, and deniability. Is there anything else? you think about from the CBRN that we haven't actually covered yet? Training. Training? The cost and training time to retrain and fit out um, Ukrainian forces with CBRN equipment and detectors and stuff. Like, you know, the, the Australian Army unit that I was from is about, you know, 500 people in it was millions and millions of dollars to try to fit out, train and equip the Ukrainian army to operate in a chemical environment is massive. And that would draw a lot of financial resources away from weapon systems that they currently need to win. Yeah. And I guess the scope of that equipment would be massive. You know, you're, you're good whatever the masks are, your top level masks are like a thousand dollars. And how, how long do your filters last for in those before you're changing them out? It really does depend on the mask, the environment. Um, we've talked, I think on your last show that um, the gentleman was talking about the worst case, which is any of the canister killer agents. And, and you do have on gross exposure about 20 minutes, but on the whole, most of the threats are vapor threats so you can get a good three hours out of um a, you know canister if you're if you're stuck in that environment but on the tactical battlefield if you're exposed to it you're going to get out of that environment in which case the canister stops being degraded so that's that's not such a such an issue but as shane was saying even a single use of a single say chemical rocket would would so dramatically change the nature of the protective posture and tactics it would put this huge handbrake on the situation that people would have to and, and i'm sure that they're, they're already thinking about this and they've already looked at options but um if they went that way if the russians went that way it would be a huge um pivot the, the whole conflict would would need to adjust even the training in medics and the medical supplies you know for to counter the effects of some of these these agents and is is massive um and and again you know if we're looking at escalation and and putin he wouldn't need to use a nuclear weapon to have the same effect at firing one chemical weapon into an environment they get the same same in a lot of ways the escalations there the threats there um the effect on the population the fear on the population you know like I've spoken to elderly uh, Kurdish residents in Kurdistan that still remember when Saddam fired sarin up into those areas after the first Gulf War. Um, it, it's a legacy thing that wouldn't go away. So, uh, And it really does depend too. Sorry to jump in there, Shane. Willie, you know, a 20 minutes for a, a certain canister against a certain agent, well, that's based on the Australian canister that they were, they were using I don't know if that's changed recently. I don't know if the respirator's changed, but it would depend on what the threat is. So if they're using rudimentary devices that that distribute chlorine, for example, pretty simple respirators with, with pretty basic canisters would protect the force. And then that threat dissipates pretty quickly. So things would change, but they wouldn't change in a crazy way. Deployment of a persistent nerve agent a, a totally different story. You're in full mop gear, you know, the, the works. One thing I did notice in my experience over there, and I've had no experience with um, live Russian soldiers. If you, you know, you occasionally see a tank or something in the, in the distance, but you know, there's no up close and personal that doesn't exist in an artillery war, but with the 
with going through positions of um, sadly dead Russian soldiers. Um, you know, I say sadly because any young, particularly men or young people, um, or I should say mostly men uh, in those positions, is to me is a sad side of 18, 19, 20 year old men killed by the dozen is fucking sad, um, no matter where you stand. But something I saw was they all had respirators um, because, of course, the Ukrainians went through their equipment to make sure, you know, there was no booby traps, no whatever, and also and the same ammunition type to take the ammunition and to take their body armor plates. You know, you, you're going through these um, dead soldiers' equipment, whatever, you know, going, you know, going through it. But they all had gas masks. Now, I can't speak on the quality of them, I should say that I never saw mop gear as far as boots, gloves, shirt, trousers, but they all had gas masks, which I thought was a weird So what does thing. that tell you? So what does that tell you when a, an army is issued and they're carrying that equipment to the front line? Well, well, to me, it, it says that there is some level of threat Um of course, and I carried, I pulled out before, I carried my full time, I carried a gas mask. I don't, I don't have a filter on this, but, you know, I carried a, a mask the entire time on me. But don't, um, don't forget that the respirator is not just for uh, toxic chemicals threats. It's no. you, you wear a respirator if you're going to throw CS gas into a building for room clearance. You, you want a respirator on if you're going to be exposed to smoke deployed from artillery because that could be white phosphorus generated smoke. Yes. That's also But, but even that, even and I agree 100% with you, Andrew, but even that escalation means that it's a tool in the commander's chest. You know what I mean? Like, even if they fire, even if they drop a barrel bomb of chlorine, right? If they, they, they're more likely potentially to do it knowing that their soldiers have got those masks on them. You know, as a way to clear the flock. We're having trouble. We're bogged down. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians are in fixed position, fighting positions, right? Let's drop this in. Our guys have already got the mask on them. And then why the enemy doesn't and they're in that capacitated state, let's move through and clear them, which is what they did in Syria. That is Syrian Russian tactics 101. You know, the insurgent groups, whether it was Al Qaeda or ISIS or uh, Syrian freedom fighters are bogged down in a urban environment um, they can't dislodge them, so they literally use barrel bombs to incapacitate them so then those Syrian forces can move through and take that area. So that, to me, um, even along those basic lines, means that if the if in that, in, in, you know, again, impoverished army where they, they don't have much food and their equipment's not that great, but they all have gas masks on them, um, is it's doctrinally something the Russians have. Really got to sort of look yeah. at why they're given the gas masks, because as Willie was saying before, it's it's not for their um, health and well-being because, you know, they're not they're not cared for in that way in, in, say, our military, they would be. So are they given gas masks because the ploy is um, we're going to use something and we want our guys to be left standing at the end of that and not them? Or is the ploy, hey, we really think Ukraine's going to use something? Or is it hey, we want to give our guys gas masks to prove that we're worried about Ukrainians having a dirty bomb. You, they, they, you could go very conspiratorial. No, agreed, with but it. It, it, to me, it's still doctrinally. Like, doctrine, like it, it, if they're, if it's, here's your uniform, here's your rifle, here's this, here's your gas mask, it's part of their doctrine to issue True. every yep. soldier. Yep. And, and to me, that is exactly what we saw in Syria, that doctrinally... Uh, for whatever purpose, who knows? But if it's, you know, like, uh, it's not just their paratroopers that have got them. It's not just their... Yeah, American we, we do the same, right? Agree, agree. Yeah, because in our doctrine, you know, remember when we joined the army, you would do those days up for two weeks and you'd live in your mob gear in, in, in your fighting pits and all that kind of stuff. And it sucked because part of our doctrine was that Missouri and Camaria had, you know, chemical weapons. But it was in the doctrine. So all I'm saying is, if doctrinally it's in, in the Russians to have their soldiers with those masks, means that if they know they can, and we saw this is the other thing because we saw it in Syria. Um, if we drop, you know, chlorine, it's not going to affect our guys compared to 
the other guys. Yeah, that advantage you can you can create, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, you go. Well, just like you said, you know, when you're going through um, uh, dead enemy combatants and you're finding these different bits of kit, that's one of the things you start asking yourself: Why do they have them and we don't? You know, and then you start asking your commanders, like whether it be comms gear or first aid kits, and you know. Why, why don't we have ga gas masks? Or why can't, you know, were they picking them up and taking them with them? It's that there's ingrained in everything military is a psychological effect. You know, like you said that the Russians were getting issued bits of wood for, for body armour. That has a psychological effect on that Russian soldier if he sticks his head up. If you know you've got good ballistic plates, you're more likely to maybe to take a risk than if you don't, for example. Yeah. Probably something um, that you might be able to speak on, Andrew, is, and this is something that I should say I can be wrong in as well. You know, in like an explosion, you've got primary and secondary fragmentation and primary is, you say, a shell lands, bits of shell hitting you and secondary being it hits, lands on the road and bits of bitumen or steel kick up and, and kill you. What sort of threats are out there for, for want of a better term, but like almost like secondary chemical attack. Like, you know, you're in the steelworks in Mariupol where, you know, the Russians were bombing the shit out of that area. Surely industrial zones like that have incredibly dangerous chemicals that may not be a chemical attack as far as Russia or Ukraine attacking you, but a shell has landed on a tank full of whatever and becomes a very dangerous chemical agent. What are the risks of that in a in a country on a state level? Certainly bulk chemical storage is a concern. There was a, a chlorine gas accident at the port of Jordan, I think last year, this year, and a huge amount of chlorine was released. Uh, a couple of people were killed. So any, any of your bulk chemical storage particularly things like your strong mineral acids, your oxidizing agents like sulfuric acid, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, they're all used very heavily in industry um, for lots and lots of different things. So the release of that liquid and the vapor, the acidic vapor off gassing from that would be an immediate hazard to the surrounding area, uh, can certainly start fires, can certainly cause a lot of corrosion damage to infrastructure, uh, and breathing those fumes in is not a not a good thing. Um, same, same if you have bulk phosgene, chlorine, um, you know, bulk flammable chemicals as well, uh, acetylenes, um, all of those sorts of things. You, you know, you can have explosion risks once it mixes with air, all that sort of sort of stuff. If you're talking about, um, you know, hitting nuclear facilities, that's a whole different conversation, obviously, but that's accidental meltdown kind of deal if you if you inadvertently disrupt the reactor's ability to prevent the chain reaction occurring in the reaction vessel yeah yeah that makes sense shane have you got any anything to say on that on like almost like accidental dispersion um no but it's a uh, it is common and even if you look at the um uh explosion in um lebanon from uh, the storage, the warehouse there uh, a couple of years ago of uh, nitrates. So it, it's definitely a, um, a threat that we see a lot more than we is openly reported, you know, around the world for sure. Yeah. Um, another thing that I was thinking about, I've got some notes here. There's only a few more, not to, not to take up too much <laughs> of your, your important days. But as far as a CBRN threat, how in a professional sense, was the US firing depleted uranium rounds not a CBRN attack? And I, I, in my opinion, I'm an untrained, I'm a journalist. To me, that fits the description. It's principally because the desired effect of that weapon system um, was to destroy armor. The adverse side effect or resultant contamination was the depleted uranium dust created in that kinetic interaction. So, so they're not trying to release depleted uranium dust, but it happens as a, as a result of a kinetic, um, 
you know, anti-armor strike, as opposed to a mortar containing mustard gas being fired over the heads of troops. Its sole purpose is to disperse the mustard gas onto the troops. So I guess, arguably, um, you could feign some ignorance. Uh, I, I really couldn't speak to um, the U.S.'s position on that that kind of thing, but I think it's because it's not its intended use. Right. Yeah, I, I, and I, th I think ignorance is, in my opinion, out the window. You know, you've got I'm a I'm an idiot who's done Year Twelve physics, and I know you're shooting depleted uranium at a sixty ton tank with a wall of steel. That's not going to fucking end well. Um, and I think also, even if there is ignorance, people in the military, in the military industrial complex, have an accountability to be like, hang on, what is, are there any byproducts of this weapon system? Um, and if, if it is ignorance, it still need to be held accountable. You're the subject matter expert for that. Um, but how I look at it is if Russia started doing that, we would completely say, Hey, that's a, that's a biological, not biological, that's a CBRN threat that just because it's not its intended use, you could say, Oh, well, the, the Zaporanzia power plant has melted down and it's blown a nuclear cloud onto um, a Zaporanzia city. Oh, that wasn't its intended use. I, th I think, in my opinion, and, and maybe Shane, you'd be better to speak on this, but is um, just because its intended use isn't, the effect of it, which is pretty obvious, in, at least in my opinion, is something that I guess we, is a slippery slope to start going down. Uh, that is a very, very controversial subject. Um, um, and um, my, so just, my, let, my, Shane, you don't have to comment on it. It's fine no, no, if you no, don't, no, if you don't no, want to I'll comment. Put it here. Shane, let us jump in one, one sec before yeah. you round that thought bubble out. So what, what I suspect occurred is everyone went, hey, we've got all this depleted uranium left over from the use of enriched uranium, right? Nuclear fuel. Hmm. It's really dense. It's really heavy. It's already made. Let's use it in in situations where we need dense, heavy projectiles to hit armored things. And I think that they did that, you know, and I'm just, just guessing here, so quickly before they really had the chance to go, oh, hang on, you know what? Um, we're getting all these reports of veterans with, um, you know, complaining about carcinogenic, you know, whatever, mm. from breathing the dust, you know, that that kind of thing. I don't know to be so, honest, but that's so, my guess. Um, there's a very famous Hollywood movie that covers this subject that the US government absolutely went crazy on. Um, it, the, the, the adversary and the targets that they were used on weren't the intended ones, given it was a Cold War mentality. But the question I was going to pose is uh, the same could be said for Agent Orange and Napalm. <laughs> And I think I think it I think but I think it should be questioned as well. Down to who's who's using them, and who are they being used on? Yes, and I think that's where a lot of my because I try and stay as um, non political at least myself and siding with something. And where I see a lot of this is the West somehow. Oh, I shouldn't say somewhat get away with doing some things that we so would look true, down upon that? other countries. Why is that? Because I think because we see ourselves as the good guy in all these scenarios. No, no, and no, no, and we, oh, that's what I mean. We want, well, you could say we didn't win Vietnam. Um, but also to, we, the Victor writes history. And I think at the end of the day, uh, where I'm trying to put myself and not, not to get to, um, you know, make assumptions. Or, but if I was a 25 or 20, bloody 26 now, 26 year old podcaster, in Russia, and I would be thinking, but the only country to have used this in a con maybe in a conventional sense, as far as you know, not behind false flag, not behind a militia group we're funding, but as Australia, America using those weapons, and like what Agent Orange did to our veterans, and with. And, and I call absolute bullshit that the scientists did not know the fucking effect of that. That's in my mind, bullshit. Um, is that it needs to be some accountability of what we did to the local populace and our own guys in multiple situations is 
is terrible. And we, we've done that. And we see it as fine because we've done it, we've won, we're the victors and we can't do no wrong. And I think we sometimes need to look at the other side and go, maybe, maybe people don't see us as innocent as we may see ourselves. Um, so uh, it's funny. I literally had this conversation with someone two days ago after we watched the Warner Von Braun documentary. Um, and it ties in a little bit with what we're talking about here. Um, the whole um, reason behind the uh, Cold War was when the French, the Brits, the US and the Russians were hurtling into Berlin at the end of the Second World War, they were all trying to get there first for a purpose. Yes, the French were trying to get their art art back. The Brits kind of were like what the Russians and the Americans were after scientists. Yep. And uh, there's a very, very, you know, Operation Paperclip, uh, I think it's like 1,200 Nazi scientists, even out of Nuremberg. They literally took people out of Nuremberg jail cells and brought them back to the US that, you know, who worked on the nuclear weapons and all these other technologies and, the founder of NASA, Werner von Braun, was a Nazi, you know, and he was a rocket expert. And, and um, you know, we overlook, you know, um, what we, what we, it, it helps us strategically. Um, and we're talking about, you know, uh, Putin, they're already saying he's committed war crimes. Or these three that just got found guilty in The Hague for shooting down the Malaysian flight in Ukraine. Why aren't they going to be brought to justice? Why aren't they actually, why weren't they in person? Because why is, Ed, why is Edward Snowden still being defended? Because he's in a country that um, has a veto at the UN and that uh, sees its, itself with its own set of rules and, and regulations. And then the US and, you know, um, if you, you know, think about, and this is kind of the conversation I had the other day, if the Nazis had won second, the Second World War, what US generals would have been put on trial? Yes. So anyway, yeah, that uh, that's a that's a, a much too deep and philosophical conversation. Well, it's something I think I think Shane, you and I will have a and maybe an online chat if guys would like to see that about I guess some of the um, ethics and history and the intelligence behind that. If that's something you'd be interested in doing at a later yeah, time, hundred percent. And ethics, ethic in warfare is. Um, and, you know, I know it's it's touching me and a lot of my mates closely at the moment too, but that's the never-ending question, is it? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what ethics are you bound to and who dictates that? And uh, and literally, who holds them to account? Yeah. You know? like, um, yeah, that's yeah. definitely uh, uh, subjects and topics that I'll be happy to unpack at a later date. Um, Andrew, something, I, I guess, and we'll, we'll start sort of finishing up, but that I really want to talk about. And this ties in both to you personally, uh, being an engineer and also uh, your business, but is the IEDs and booby traps um, that we've seen, you know, well through Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, you know, ISIS tub and all, everyone. Um, even you could go back um, to, to lots of militia groups, whatever, um, you know, even in Ireland, everything about this, but the, I guess, ongoing threat of IEDs and booby traps in a country like uh, Ukraine. And maybe even if you could explain what they are, what they do, and maybe even a way for people to avoid them, because there's a lot of people coming back into these recently liberated areas that are IED to the shit and Ukraine does not have the resources. We wouldn't have the resources uh, in a conventional state level conflict like this to actually clear everything you know don't touch this don't touch that could you express a bit more on booby traps and ids sorry if that question sure. was 50 in one <laughs> no, no no that's all good um so i guess comparing um the last 20 years to what's happening in ukraine um people often ask and this is true of homemade explosives as well as ied um arming and functioning forces right the brains of the bomb everything changes but nothing's different right? TTPs get recycled. The pipe bomb, the good old IRA pipe bomb from decades ago is still around. It still gets used because it still works. When you compare a lot of the last 20 years, right? The 9-11 wars and, and what, what we've seen, they fit, 
different groups figured things out at different rates and employed IED techniques in different ways. And you really employ an IED either command initiated, victim operated, or some kind of time or delay. So that will never change. Those three methods of either arming or firing or arming and firing really don't change, you know, over a long time and no matter where you are in the world. It just depends on what you have access to. So a closed peg switch, right, is one of the oldest IED switches that basically works by you put two different metal contacts on opposing sides of the closed peg and you put something in between the closed peg that keeps those two metal contacts apart. So attached to that piece, you could attach a tripwire. So when someone trips the tripwire, pulls the piece of material out, the two contacts close and the bomb explodes. Now that tactic has been around for a long time. And it, in the, you know, big wars, this stuff was all industrialized, right? So the IED wasn't an improvised explosive device. It was an, an SED. Uh, they call it specialist explosive device. So basically being produced for the military. We use the F1A1 booby trap switch, right? That's just a multi-purpose um, switch capable of being configured to initiate different ways. That's what we're sort of seeing more with Ukraine is, is they are using um, proper state level manufactured um, switches. So pressure release switches, pressure switches, tripwire switches. Um, and that you can adapt those to do anti-lift, anti-handle, anti-tilt, uh, noise sensors. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. And they're pumping them out on a big scale and they're in the uh, Russian arsenal. And they're not that hard to teach how to use, uh, especially if you've got access to conventional explosives, you can set the whole system up pretty easily. So we're not seeing the homemade um, sort of methods that we saw in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, all the rest of it. But the concept is identical. The, the method of employment is identical, camouflaged and designed mostly in Ukraine to target the victim. So it'll be a seemingly harmless action, opening a door, stepping in a, a doorway, you know, tripping a uh, tripwire, something like that. Um, so in terms of what are they doing, it's the same thing. It's the same thing that a regular guerrilla um, action that's been occurring for decades and decades. Uh, and, and from the stuff I've been seeing on open source, Facebook and all the rest of it, it's the same kind of switching systems. So they don't need to revert to building their own because they've got ready access to switches and they've obviously got their own engineers and their own specialists who are able to rig up. Um, and it's essentially a delaying, um, uh, a tritting tactic, right? So that the follow-on forces reach a, a village or a, an urban, semi-urban area uh, and you hope to wound or kill um, or just halt the progress enough that they need to come in and clear things. Um, what I have heard of, obviously, this, these thunder runs that the Ukrainians were doing in the northeast of Ukraine was just going around these areas and avoiding the booby traps altogether. And when you talk about uh, EOD response, mark and bypass, avoid the threat is number one, because then you never, you never put yourself at risk. Um, number two is blow it up where you find it. You know, number three, on and on it goes. So that's sort of what I'm seeing is um, certainly just like when we, we, um, routed ISIS in Syria, you know, Mosul had the same thing. It was booby trapped with all sorts of weird and wonderful, um, devices designed to catch the victim. Yeah. And, and seriously taking notes. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, oh no, I'm just, just, it's just my memory's shocking. Where do, <laughs> where do conventional, um, anti-purse and anti-tank landmines go into that? Uh, what do you mean in sense of how are they employing them? Well, as far as they are also, um, because, because I think if you're saying these are state made triggers, state made explosive, then it's not, does it really fit the improvised explosive device category? Because it's not like in my mind, improvised means some Taliban dude in his shed, getting a clothes peg, bloody D battery and some wire and some petrol, um, but if this is state made of a purse initiated device, that is very similar to like a landmine tread on it, explode. That's right. And it, and it is a very gray area. And there are over a couple of beers, you get 10 blokes in the room and they would give you 10 different uh, points of view on the, the subject. So 
putting an anti-personnel uh, landmine uh, with an anti-lift function underneath an anti-tank mine, that's an improvised way of employing two conventional weapon systems. Yes. So you hope that the D-miner comes up, he picks up the anti-tank landmine and the anti purse landmine blows up in his face. That's not really an IED in the sense of what, what you were just describing before, where the switch is improvised, the power supply is improvised, but it's a gray area in between how much of the conventional ordinance are you modifying to achieve an improvised effect and what, what is an IED? And that NATO's got a definition, Wikipedia's got a definition, mm. it, it varies. I would just basically look at how are they employed? What What is the nature of, of the effect that you're trying to achieve? Um, because putting a landmine, at any person landmine down is the same as employing a victim operated roadside IED, you know, a saw blade to a um, yellow palm oil container full of explosive. The effect is the same. You're relying on the victim to initiate an explosive to cause an effect. So what you call it, I think matters less than how you're employing it. What are you trying to achieve? Uh, certainly if if you can get a whole crate full of pre-made anti-purse landmines, 200 of them, they've got safety pins, they've got known arming processes, that would be safer to go and employ than, um, you know, old dodgy so-and-so's homemade IEDs where one in 10 might blow up when you go to arm it. So that's a difference as well. Yeah. And Shane, some, something I guess you might be able to speak on was myself, you know, being a soldier in Australian army, and I could be completely wrong on this. I was always under the understanding that victor, victim operated mines were um, outside, well, were not, sorry, were banned from the Geneva Convention. Now, I understand that Ukraine and Russia and both have not signed at least the degree we have of the Geneva. But is that correct? That like Australia, we cannot use victim purse operated mines? Refer to the engineering officer. That's right. Uh, I can't remember the specifics, but that you can be a signatory to the um, convention and also ratify the convention. There's two different processes. You know, we've, as far as I'm aware, we've done both. Um, so we do not doctrinally employ anti-personnel landmines. We have what they call an F1A1 booby trap switch, which is not a landmine, but it can be set up to do things like um, tripwire functions. We have, you know, that that ability, but it's not it's not an anti-purse landmine by the definition. Um, and other countries have signed the treaty but not ratified it, and then there's other countries that have not not even signed it at all. The United States still uses any purse landmines. Yeah. Shane, where does the legality sit, if you know, around the, say, countries like Australia, who have, you know, signed the complete Geneva Convention, supporting financially a country that may be using techniques and tactics that we have deemed a big no-no, like anti lines. I have a lot of friends out who are um, pulling AT and AP anti-tank anti-personnel mines out of in Ukraine and they're saying well half the ones we pull out of Russian half the ones we pull out of a Ukrainian Shane where does I guess the intelligence and what do, what do they think about that we are funding something that we would not do so that goes back to as old as war is you know um, we might use chemical weapons but the French did in World War One, for example so it, it's a political process and the politicians, the National Security Cabinet will sit in a room and go, right, uh, we're going to provide, you know, X amount of Bushmasters or financial aid to the Ukrainians who uh, have been invaded and, uh, you know, they will have an internal threshold that they'll negotiate with, say, the, the Ukrainian foreign minister and say, look, you know, um, we're happy with you to X, Y and Z, but can't kill civilians or whatever. So it comes to the will of the government whether it be the Australian government, English, whoever, supplying the funding and the aid, and then also the will of the people. So if, and I noticed you made a comment on that video of the soldiers, was it a, was it a, uh, was it ambush or was it a murder, you know, yesterday? Yeah. The Russian soldiers were lying on the ground. You know, so the, the ultimate, um, the ultimate response is by the population. So if today the Australians saw your podcast and, that was uh, also, say, shown on Channel 9 and Channel 10. And, you know, the Australian population go, this is bullshit. We're not sending, you know, millions of dollars over to um, fund soldiers that are killing 
you know, innocent people, given that we're trying to put special forces on soldiers in Australia for the same thing. Um, and, you know, so we're going to withhold funding when we've got people uh, flooding communities that need that money. So there's a number of uh, morality tests. The first one is the people. The Australian public have to be on board with the Australian government um, funding and supply of Bushmasters and, and military aid to Ukraine um, and that you and on the condition that Ukrainians are acting as a moral and uh, legal member of the Western uh, nations. Um, that's why, and I've spoken about this previously, you know, we used to talk about the strategic corporal and the strategic um, strategic digger, where in, in the modern age with uh, social media and that, the action of a corporal or the action of a digger in combat can have strategic effects because, you know, that video or that action can get national news and, um, you know, we've seen that played out a fair bit recent times in Australia. So, so I guess to answer your question is it's the will of the people which give the will of the parliament the ability to provide that funding and aid to Ukraine. Would you agree with that, Andrew? I think so. And, and it's certainly not a case where we're supplying um, anti-personnel, victim-operated weapon systems. <clears throat> so I think if, if Australia was directly or indirectly connected with situations where civilians were getting killed by victim-operated explosive something that, that was linked to Ukraine's actions, it would be a different discussion. Um, and I think that it's it's very difficult because you're not getting all the information out of Ukraine that's that's happening in all the different parts. So I really don't know. I'm not I'm not um, knowledgeable enough to know what the employment of AP and AT landmines is like in the Ukraine right now. <clears throat> well, I can I can tell you from from personal experience they are fucking everywhere. Um, I don't know who's the Russians. I don't know who's the Ukrainians. Uh, a lot of the areas I was in, I was like, well, Russians have never been here, so they'd have to be Ukrainian ones. Um, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong for doing it. I'm saying that, like, my experience is they are fucking everywhere. And so many people in places like Bucha and Erpine and places where, you know, we saw people all say that they didn't, but Russia committed horrific war crimes, um, war crimes that we haven't seen for fucking like, generations until before we'd seen war crimes that heinous. Um, and you know, they're rigging up mines to books in bookshelves and you go to pull a thesaurus off the shelf and you'd explode and all this shit. Um, but it's definitely like, uh, at least in my experience, a 50, 50, there's landmines everywhere. I have no evidence got, that and, Ukraine and Andrew, are Andrew. mining people, but as far as around roads and farms and yeah, that it goes into too, that there was a farmer we spoke to in the Kharkiv region, um, who from Russian, um, both landmines and um, cluster munitions dropping on his farm lost a thousand head of his 1200 head of cattle or around that amount. And that goes into, I guess, almost linking back to almost, it's not a biological attack, but to some degree you, that's taking away food of that area. And it's, you know, it is absolutely arid and all. He can't go into that farm because if there's a thousand cows have trod on a cluster munition or a mine, holy fuck, like, you know, the food in that area is diminished. You can't use that to farm for, there's still every year you hear about in bloody France and Germany, there's people explode from mines from the forties at mines from the teens. How's this going to look in a hundred? And these are uh, speaking to a, an EOD tech while I was over there. I've got a video on my YouTube who, who was basically saying these mines are significantly better made now than they were then. And if these bombs and shit were lasting in the ground from world war one, world war two till now, Think of how long these state-made, well-made, sealed mines will last. You just got to look at Africa, you know. Uh, Africa is a great example, and Cambodia and places like that still. But, the, the and Andrew touched on it, the question comes down to what is the uh, strategic, operational, tactical effect that they want to achieve to use that? So is it denial of ground? Is it as a barrier? Of, mm. So if you look at the way the, the US and the South Koreans use mines in the DMZ, it's to stop North Korea coming over the border. Uh, is it a delaying tactic? And, and Andrew was right where, you know, when they put booby traps and IEDs and mines in a, in a city that they've just lost, it's to stop that army advancing further because they have to go and 
um, and render safe all of that area, you know, and as he, we said, the Thunder Runs is to bypass that and the follow-on forces to then to to then clear, render safe and clear those areas. So you've got to look at what is the strategic, what is the operational, what is the tactical effect of any device, whether it be rockets or IEDs or mines. Um, and, you know, as we saw and, you know, we've seen uh, redirecting them. So they may be a Russian mine that they've been trained to pick up and redeploy. So they go, well, they're Russian mines. Well, actually, they've been redeploying or vice versa. So you've got to kind of look at at a tactical level, uh, who's doing it, why they're doing it, what's the outcome, uh, all the way up to strategically, why were they put on the battle space or what doctrinally are they being used for? Yeah, yeah. Um, Andrew, how... You know, we speak a lot about detection equipment, yeah, M9 paper, whatever you said. Um, is there anything, if you personally lived in the east of Ukraine now, and I'm not, in my opinion, attack like this, a dirty bomb, whatever, is a real threat. Is there anything people can do to maybe protect themselves from it or um, limit the effect if something like that was to happen? It's quite difficult for some of the threats. <clears throat> so the chemical threat's probably the easiest, <clears throat> sorry, because the detection technology has been around for a long time. It's quite well miniaturized. Um, so depending on who you are, how much money you've got, what protection do you want, there are great small uh, personal alarm systems that can sniff the air and tell you, you know, do I smell a chlorine threat, you know, do et cetera. There's colorimetric systems. So what Shane mentioned before, I think it was M8, M9 paper. It's basically like masking tape, dark colored masking tape. You put over your boots, your clothes. If it gets certain chemicals on it, it changes color. So they're very cheap, fast to deploy materials. But if you're walking around with this stuff, you know, taped around your, your chest or whatever, and it changes color, um, what are you going to do anyway? If you're exposed to that kind of liquid threat, you probably don't have much chance. So Chemical, if you can get a cheapish alarm system that can sniff the air uh, and just give you warning of, you know, maybe a threat that's that's coming in from uprange, upwind, for biological threats, there's very little you can do, unfortunately, without having water test kits or other kind of support. It's, it's really hard to know if your livestock's affected or your water's affected until it's too late. There are very cheap... Um, and fairly effective Geiger counters and other other sorts of uh, radiation monitoring equipment that's out there. But again, all this stuff either needs mains power or batteries, you know, needs calibration. Uh, yeah, there's there's not a whole lot, unfortunately. You, it's better off to build a community of awareness of what are the signs and symptoms that an attack is about to occur or has occurred, um, and then respond from there. It's very difficult to get that kind of equipment and training to to that many people. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm not up enough with the latest equipment systems to know, but it sounds like it could turn into a very expensive mm. uh, situation as well. But what are some of those, I guess, signs and symptoms for the average person? I think Shane alluded to some of these before. So, so the acute toxic threats. Um, you know, they, they assign all sorts of things like, oh, if you can smell almonds, if you can smell freshly cut grass, all this sort of stuff. It's like, uh, that's not what I would immediately be looking for. If you hear loud air burst sounds, if you, um, you know, if you hear something that indicates something has occurred, um, you know, maybe low flying aircraft spraying things. And then if you smell something or, um, you really do need to do some rudimentary formalized training uh, as a collective, you know, organization, what, what to look out for, because there's so many potential false positives, you know, every time Jimmy down the street, Moses lawn, you might run into the bunker, you know, so it, it's very hard to give you that um, tips and tricks advice. It, it would be more the combat indicators of whether or not a chemical radiological system has been employed, you know, yes. That kind of thing, I think, is probably the low-hanging fruit in this case. The key, the key agencies in a Ukraine context currently, yeah, are the first aid, the hospitals, the medical. When um, 
larger number of people start um, turning up with these same signs and symptoms, whether it be from gastro and that from a potential bio or blisters or irritations from potential chem or burns and that from a potential rad source. There at the moment in the current context, um, that's where your initial indicators and warnings are going to come from your first aid medical apparatuses. Yes. Now I understand that. Um, this might be more your um, bag, Shane. As far as a black market for this stuff, is there a black market for chemicals, radiological stuff? So, for yeah, yeah but for chemical, it's the internet. Right. Because you want to Google what you want to, your end state and then your precursors and, um, you know, it's essentially your science experiment. I need to purchase X, Y, and Z in these quantities in order to then mix them in this environment and the, out, the end state is this. So, yes. um, you know, we were talking about Aaron Shrinko and Saren, you know, they first had to procure all the precursors for Saren in the, the um, exact quantities, then mix them in very specific environments, quantities, temperatures to then uh, create sarin. It's not, right. um, it's not something that 70% uh, um, of the population can do quite easily. Anyone can get on the internet and Google um you know, what, what is required to make sarin or, or a chemical agent. Don't Google um, it because someone will be looking into your fucking account and find all your, uh, well, your, all your dick well, pics on We're well down that path, brother. Because <laughs> um, especially what I'm going to talk about now is uh, in a bio space, much simpler. Um, you know, you just need to get your hands on some castor beans. And again, you know, Google is your first, your first uh, point of call for that. Um, and then again, as I discussed previously in the, in the radiological space, it's, uh, you know, Google maps looking for mining sites, hospitals, facilities that house, um, you know, um, radiological sources that you can get to, you know, an abandoned mining site, abandoned hospital, um, or break into an x-ray facility. Um, um, so procuring um the um ingredients or the base products for any of the three uh, isn't that hard we have what's called the detection threshold and i alluded to before the global intelligence architecture that's constantly looking at this so um you know if someone went into a bunnings and started or a chemist warehouse and started buying certain chemicals at a certain rate then they would pop up above the detection threshold and that's pretty much universal. There's a few conventions and law enforcement organizations like Europol, Interpol, that uh, have um, big intelligence architectures looking at these things. Um, there's uh, the independent uh, atomic agency, which looks at, and because you've got to register radiological sources, so they look at where they are globally um, and where the proliferation of some of those um, sources or devices might be. Um, in the explosive space, even power gels and your, your military or your industrial grade um, uh, explosives, they're all very well documented. Um, and there is a, um, a trade in, in nefarious groups buying and selling that on the black market, 100% it's there. North Korea at a state level make a lot of their money in the proliferation of uh, weapons and munitions hmm. uh, through um, shelf companies through Southeast Asia. I'm not going to get any more of that. Um, and obviously, we're talking about a, a part of the area where since the Soviet Union broke, broke down, the proliferation of weapons and um, military technology and devices is, is out of control, you know. So um, to answer your question, 100% it's, it's out there. Um, there is millions and millions and millions of dollars um, in the intelligence community and law enforcement at a global level that tracks this and responds to this. A lot of it's done uh, under the radar. Um, 
which I'm not going to get into, but, you know, that was the world I worked in for six, seven years. And uh, when I first got into it, I was um, blown away by um, some of the reach of some of the agents and some of the operations that are undertaken that right. never, ever get reported on uh, across the spectrum. You know, um, um, yeah, so I'll leave some of that. that. But basically, yep, you know, everything is on Google now. Um, and um, as Andrew alluded to earlier about just because something can be done doesn't mean it can be done. Yeah. You really have to factor that into the chemical and the radiological space just because you can Google something and someone has in the past made a chemical uh, agent or whatever doesn't mean that anyone can do it or any anyone is capable of doing it. And um, I know that... Um, Back in the day, there were some terrorist organizations that used to literally do uh, on uh, live leak, you know, run IED classes. Mm. You could log in a live leak and watch a video on how to make a, a, an IED. And um, many people tried doing that and uh, became one of one detonations in their, their house or their basement. Man, that's Darwinism at work, mate. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So, again, just because the information's out there, um, and the uh, techniques are out there and the technologies out there doesn't mean it's that easy to do. Would you agree with that, Andrew? Yeah, for sure. In my experience, um, homemade explosives is actually surprisingly easy to make. Um, the detonator or initiator is surprisingly difficult to make. Um, and chemicals, lower end stuff, is you can get hold of and you can figure out how to disperse is on the easier end. In my experience, everything else with chem warfare agents, bio, rad, um, it's not that easy. It honestly is not that easy. Which is, we just why, which is why we don't see it. Yes. Even groups like Al Qaeda and the Islamic State that, you know, uh, had some actual boffins, you know, some PhD graduate scientists um, in laboratories with moons that I was working on this, they still weren't able to get anything above real crude devices, uh, you know, and they, yes, they deployed them, especially the Islamic state in Iraq and Syria with mustard and stuff. But that, that, that was only rudimentary and wasn't anything real sophisticated. So it's not what you see in Hollywood. What's that George Clooney, George Clooney and Nicole Kidman movie, where the guy jumps to the back of a truck and dismantles a nuclear bomb and puts it in a backpack and he's running around Europe. That's, that's just not a feasible or achievable. So I don't think we have to worry about, some uh, Russian Wagner group dude with a backpack running around Kiev. Yeah, right. Um, there's a really good documentary that's on Netflix that you, you sort of spoke about things being sold out of the Soviet Union. And it's actually called Operation Odessa. Odessa is in Odessa. the yep. uh, southwest of Ukraine. And these Scary. basically a drug cartel wanted to buy a, buy a Soviet top of the line submarine. And it was all ready to go until the American like DEA broke it. But there's also the question of, well, well everything to do with say drugs for every like brick they find, there's multiple get through and you're like, Holy shit. What actually, but you, you what actually got watched the Nicholas Cage movie, Lord of war. And that is a true story, right? Hmm. Of him going, he's, he's a uh, played a, a Bulgarian or something. His uncle was a Russian general and he was selling weapons all through the middle East and Africa it is a hundred Yuri is hundred percent true. And in the making of the movie, there's a scene where they've got a C-130 full of AKs and stuff on an airfield, and they've got to take off quickly, and they're pushing them out the back. It was cheaper to buy real weapons than it was to get dummy weapons. And they deliberately did it that way to prove a point how easy it is to buy Soviet weapons in Africa. Yeah. So I guess just to finish up, and I know this might take a few minutes of explaining, but what do each of you think the real threat or the real possibility that we see a CBRN attack happen in Ukraine in the short term? Well, I'll give you my most likely, most dangerous in good uh, military tradition. Uh, most likely in, in the combat areas could be the use of chemical um, for area denial for buying of time for transitioning the tempo and the nature of the kinetic operations 
um, in the irregular space, the use of, you know, bio chemicals, something like that may be radiological against a big city like Kiev is obviously the most obvious, but there's tons of other big cities, um, as part of the, you know, really, uh, irregular warfare, uh, crazy, um, sort of system that's going on there at the moment. Most dangerous for me would be, as we discussed earlier, some kind of low yield nuclear strike on a major city uh, or somewhere of significance, you know, to create that separation. Um, that would really be the most dangerous. All right. So my most likely most dangerous are actually in order of the uh, the different things. So I think my most likely in the um, short to medium term is a uh, chlorine attack by uh, Russia, using that as an area of denial or uh, to retake an area, as a, as a, as we've seen in Syria. And uh, you know they've used it in Syria for that exact effect. They've got away with it. Uh, the international community didn't really carry on about it. So I think. Um, They've got the runs on the board. They've got the technology. It's not that hard to do to deliver some short-range uh, chlorine munitions or even a, a, a barrel bomb into one of those built-up areas that Ukraine are really they've taken, uh, especially when we're getting further to the south, those areas that Putin's already claimed that are now Russian. Uh, that'll go into uh, my next one in the biospace, almost an accidental uh, outbreak of some sort of... Um, pathogen through food you know the, you just to, just again getting into winter short food supplies <coughs> providing you know bad meat or whatever that the ukrainian soldiers eat you know again in order to slow down the ukrainian advance um, and that's been the time you know gallipoli dysentery uh, gettysburg's dysentery that kind of thing just simply to put the ukrainian army on the back step tactical pause uh, for the russians to regroup um, I think it's um, unlikely that a state-based radiological source will be used in a Ukrainian built-up area. Um, there's always a possibility of uh, one of the separatist groups uh, doing uh, some sort of low-yield, low-sophistication operation. Uh, but again, that will uh, might be a... Uh, tactic used first i think that they'll use a chem because i think what putin's going to do is to see what he can get away with if he can use chemical weapons to achieve that effect and no one's really complaining and i mean when i say chemical i mean chlorine i think if he used sarin there'd be more of an international outrage but he they used chlorine for years in syria no one really said anything so he can have a similar effect a very denial uh put fear in the population using chlorine and you won't have to escalate to a radiological source or, and then my most dangerous and most unlikely is that he uses a nuclear weapon for this, for the fact that um, there's no going back. He loses, but the moment he does that, he loses all political leverage. You've done it, mate. We're fucking coming for you. It's an end game. Um, and if he was to win, what is going to be left of Russia, really? So I think that um, the the nuclear option is uh, very unlikely. Um, you know, yes, it's the most dangerous for uh, the effect, but politically, he gets nothing from it. So uh, yeah, so my most likely is a um, low yield incapacitating agent being used against the Ukrainian forces on the front line where they're you know taking back territory in order as a delaying tactic and for putin to test the waters of the international reaction um yeah yeah what what do you think shane of the the possibility of a false flag to draw more nato funding or possibly nato forces? false flag for what for uh ukraine uh having a false flag cbrn attack i will really drop the end but as i guess cbr attack uh, to possibly have NATO go, holy shit! Yep, we're doing, we're dropping this in, or we're We've money just seen in. That for... With the the two missiles hitting Poland, exactly, and nothing's happened. No, 
whether that was, you know, if you saw what Zelezny come straight out, they've attacked us, they've attacked Poland, you've got to invade now. And the West went, hang on, hang on. Right, let's have a look. But that was a lot more easy to disprove than, hey, there's this whatever. That was some, he was speaking Russian. He was a Wagner Agreed. guy with a backpack but what on. It, what it did show is the West isn't going to overreact. Yeah. They're still going to pause and do some research. So even if there's a false flag that, you know, there's a, a chemical attack in a, in a Ukrainian city, and even if the Ukrainians do it to blame the Russians, what that missile attack in a Poland has shown is the West is going to want, well, hang on, we're not doing anything. We're going to send uh, uh, experts in ourselves to mm -hmm. test, and we're going to get samples, and we're going to make sure that it was a Russian, you know what I mean? And yeah, um, uh, I'll tell you this, right, and it cracks me up. There's the two Malaysian flights. There was the one in Ukraine that got shot down, and there's that one uh, that went missing. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. How is it the US have satellite photos of the minute a missile hit the one in Ukraine and a photo of where the launcher was, but they've got no satellite imagery of the other one? The US yeah. have satellite, global satellite imagery of the entire globe. The US have the ability to pinpoint points of origin and points of impact. So that's why they knew where those missiles, those rockets were from, and which is why I'm saying what that did show both the Ukrainians and the Russians in the world, especially the US, will tactically pause, do their own investigation before mm. they commit US capital to an escalation. Yes. And I, I, just to talk on my opinion, I believe that missile attack did a lot of harm to the reputation and a bit of a boy who cries wolf because if it, next time, if it is a real one, we will go, well, last time actually you claimed it incorrectly um, or most likely incorrectly, uh, we're going to take a tactical pause. Yeah, I, um, agree. I think, I think it right did a lot of damage. That, yeah, I think you're 100% right when you said that Zelensky overplayed his hand and, and it didn't work well for him. Yeah. Um, the last thing, Andrew, you said about these um, smelling devices, alarms. Um, I actually have a few uh, journalist friends who work in you know conflict zones and they carry these devices with them, even just for hotel rooms because they can pick up um, like a, a methane or gas leak or whatever. C could you give us maybe uh, an idea of a name or, or something of one? I've got to admit that I'm out of date with what the latest ones are. The yeah. The standard defense one, which you can look up, you know, is publicly available, I think is made by a company called Smith's and they're called LCD, uh, 3.2, 3.3, something like that, um, I believe is what they're using. Um, there are other systems. Um, I, I can't remember who makes them like micro alert systems and that Drager make a bunch of air sniffing systems. There, there's several companies out there that do them. Um, I believe the one that our defense force chose, um, was for a body worn, um, air sniffing personal chemical alarm. And yeah. it does, as you said, a whole range of different things. Um, I've got no idea on cost and or any of that no, stuff. That, that's fine. So there's oh, a yeah. um, MX908, which is a, a rapid detection. Uh, no, that can no be that's a that's a that's a fentanyl detector. That's a, a dual mass spec system. It's that's 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 a different application. So that won't pick everything else up. No, nah, and they're a hundred grand each or something. So I wouldn't. Well, there you go. <laughs> I wouldn't. It, they they weigh a lot. I wouldn't. You wouldn't yeah. carry one around. Hundred grand, you can take me and I'll sniff the air for you. <laughs> no, they're mainly for fentanyl detection. Those nine hundred eight, the MX nine hundred eight. I'm going to take a nightclub in with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, because I know there's some that are you know very cheap, you know, in the tens or hundreds of dollars. Um, yeah. That I know some journalists who conflict got who just do, you know, they travel full time. They're like, I don't trust that in, you know, they're not staying in the Hilton. They're in and out of different countries. And even if they go into just a random hotel, they're like, I don't know if their smoke alarm's been checked or their gas has been checked. I don't trust it. And totally. Double A battery in it, sit it on their shelf and sleep at night. And, yep. you know, and this is well outside of the CBR and um, like D as far as defense threat. This is just in everyday shit. It's something to be, I guess, very aware of. So I've just, just done a quick check and it, it's, I recommend everyone do their own research. There would be stacks of ex army engineer guys or, or, you know, guys that have worked in this space before who have a lot more knowledge than me on this, but there certainly are small, relatively inexpensive systems, um, 
Honeywell is another company that make a lot of air sniffing systems. So theirs was the Gas Alert Micro 5 series. I know Defense used that at some stage. And as you said, it does lower and upper explosive limits. It does oxygen deficient environments, all that sort of thing. So you would want something small, simple to use, good battery life, not too expensive. Um, I, I reckon if you reached out to your network, there'd be a smart guy out there who'd know a, a good system to use. I, I'm not up to date with it. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Oh, no, that that's fine. It'll, it'll give people something to look at anyway, because people may not know that actually exists something like that, especially if you're just traveling. Like I, I know my friends, they recommend, even doesn't matter if you're a war journalist or not, if you're traveling, staying in and out of hostels and rooms and whatever, it's fucking worth having because there's some horrific shit happen to people. That See, a big one is, is yeah. um, just um, from combustible heaters inside during winter. Yeah. The buildup of, uh, there's a lot of, um, just in Australia, I'll say the, the poorer socioeconomic families that use those heaters inside in winter, there's a lot of ambulance gets called out to asphyxiation to them. So that's yes. not a bad call. Yeah. Um, when you're going to third world countries, especially as we were talking before with, um, you know, heat's going to be a big thing in Europe this winter. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, is there anything you think you may have missed, anything you want to touch on before we go? If you want to have a quick read over the notes and see if we hit everything you wanted to. So the last thing is, if you remember when we were talking about radiologic radiation, I was saying about there was a the girls that, that painted their uh, teeth and stuff. Ah, yes. Radium girls, they were called. So they used to use radium to paint luminous watches. Right. Because it glowed. And so they started painting, uh, using the radium, painting their teeth and guns and stuff. Hmm. And uh, yeah, literally they were called radium girls. They'd go to nightclubs and their teeth would all be shining. And they all end up with cancer of the jaws and it's, it's massive in America. So Jesus. Um, things that we don't know. Absolutely. Andrew, is there anything you think I, we've missed? I think that's pretty comprehensive, mate. We've, we've chewed three hours of your day up. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> no, well, well, we chewed up three hours of my day in this podcast, but in the, um, in the before this, trying to get the technical stuff, right. We chewed <laughs> up about five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> Well, gentlemen, I can't, like Andrew and Shane, I can't thank you guys enough for um, for coming on, helping me out with with this, getting some good information out there and, and a chat and, you know, taking up, you know, three hours of your time is a lot more valuable than mine. So um, I, I really can't thank you guys enough. And if you've made it this far in the podcast, I can't thank you enough either. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Willie. Appreciate um, uh, you, got, you having us on, mate. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, as we get in, if... if any of these courses of action change or there is a, some sort of attack and stuff and people want uh, some more information or clarity, mate, feel free to hit us up and, and reach out again. Absolutely. I look, I look forward to it, lads. Right. Thanks, well, Willie. Uh, no, anytime. I'll see you guys soon. Cheers, brother. See you, mate. Bye.